Have you always loved writing? I have. I grew up uh, with my nose in a book all the time. And I think around third grade, I decided to write my first novel. <laughs> so I, I attempted it then. Um, and so I've always loved stories. I'll, I'll back up and say that. But um, writing was something that I sort of did in order to convey the stories in my head, right? So, yeah. And were these like Ramona Cleary or like what, what kind of books were these? Uh, I grew up on Nancy Drew. Oh, nice. That was my favorite. And then I moved to Stephen King. So that was an interesting transition. <laughs> my parents thought as long as I was reading, I was doing something good for my brain. And so they just let me read whatever I wanted to. Um, so Stephen King became my, my go-to when I was about 10 or 11. Interesting. So yeah. you, liked, you liked mysteries and solving things rather than a prom queen yeah. you know, get stood up or something. I mean, I'm sure there was plenty of that, too. I definitely read the Sweet Valley High series religiously in, in junior high or something. But, um, but yeah, Stephen King was kind of the go-to um, from about age 10 on. And then any, any sort of mystery I could get my hands on, I would have read that, too. What pushed you toward filmmaking? That's a good question. don't know. Um, let's see. Uh... So I grew up in Portland, and um, when I moved back there after college, I started working at a small um, commercial production company, and that was my first exposure, really, to any sort of filmed uh, medium. And um, I, you know, as I got to know a lot of the commercial directors, it turned out they were also all making short films and trying to make feature films on the side. Uh, and so that that was my first kind of exposure to just the fact that people even made films um, and that it was it was something that you could pursue as a career as well. So you grew up uh, in the Pacific Northwest and then you went to school at ASU? I did, yeah. Wow, so you were done with the rain or you just wanted <laughs> exactly. to be around sunshine for a while? Exactly, no, I grew up in the rain, 300 days of rain a year and um, when it came time to go to college, I had a friend who went to ASU the year before I did and so I thought, that seems pretty nice. Look at that. Look at all that sunshine. <laughs> right. Clear sky. Yeah. And, yep. And did you study writing there? At no, I was a psych major. Ah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And you were planning on doing something with the psychology degree? or? Well, I like to say that I, I think I was drawn to the psych degree because um, I, by, the time it, by the time I had to declare a major, I had so many psych classes that it just made sense <laughs> to finish out that degree. But really, it was just a good sort of broad liberal arts education. I mean, I had to take all of the, you know, the English and sociology and um, sort of, you know, basic stuff that everyone has to take. Um, but my electives were always psychology classes, too. I always liked the abnormal psych classes and even the research uh, classes that I had to take for, for psychology, where it was like data analysis. All of that stuff was fun for me, yeah. How often would the people around you discourage you from being a writer? Oh. Um, you know, growing up, I wasn't discouraged from being a writer. Uh, my parents both totally encouraged reading, and so writing as an extension of that, they encouraged that as well. Um, I would say through college, everyone encouraged writing. Um, it probably wasn't until I moved to LA and um, sort of started, you know, dipping my toe into the screenwriting that um, that I heard about how hard it would be and how um, you know how challenging it was to launch a career and sustain a career in screenwriting. So um, I don't know. Maybe maybe it's just after after you get um, sort of exposed to the realities of making money doing you know an artistic sort of career that um, people get cynical. <laughs> as a kid, they totally encouraged it. But as an adult, people are like, do something more stable, you know. So you went to school at ASU and then you went back to Oregon mm -hmm. and, and worked within the film community there or production companies? Yeah, I worked at a commercial production company in Portland. Um, they were doing um, all sorts of commercials. What was the most fun for me, though, was helping out with the short films that the directors were doing on the side. And then what prompted you to move to L.A. from Oregon? Well, I'd worked in uh, commercials for a little over a year, and I sort of felt like I'd had enough exposure to know that this was something that interested me, um, just sort of the entertainment business in general kind of had a, you know, a draw. Um, and I felt like I, I knew enough or I'd seen enough about um, how short films were made that I knew maybe I could do something in production. Uh, I wasn't exactly sure what I wanted to do, but I thought, I'll come to LA, figure it out when I get there. Um, so that's what I did. 
Did you notice any differences in the way the industry is approached at <laughs> being in uh, Oregon versus in, LA? in Portland versus LA? Yeah. Um, yeah. Hold on. Yes. Yeah, oh, sure. The first thing I noticed, actually, um, when I worked at that commercial production company, we did have some business occasionally with uh, different companies in LA. So I would end up having to call various vendors in LA to and ask for things, you know, order things or whatever. And the first thing that I noticed about the difference between Portland and LA is that people in LA have no patience for you on the phone. I would call and I would make small talk like, hey, how's it going? How are you today? Because that's what you do in Portland. And, um, and they'd be like, yeah, what do you need? <laughs> so um, that was the big difference that I noticed uh, while I was still in Portland. Sure. Um, let's see, after moving to LA, uh, let me think, big differences. Um, yeah, I can't, it's so far, so long ago, I'm not sure I remember any. Sure, sure, that's, but that it's an interesting thing that where you were trying to just be genuine and then, <laughs> yes. and you saw that that doesn't work and maybe it's even almost like, seen as like, what do they want, you know? Right, so. it was, I think people thought that I was, I think people that I was talking to thought that I didn't know what I was doing because they were like, listen, if you if you knew what you were doing really, you would know that we don't have time to make small talk, just tell me what you need and I gotta get off the phone, you know? So. Sure, sure, yeah, yeah. Sometimes I know kindness can be seen as a weakness here. I'd mm. like to think that that's not, but there is occasion when, when I have seen that. Mm. Um, what makes you great at story and how did you get good at it? My big education in story was really when I worked for Blake on his second book. Um, just because the, the thing that I had to do in that role as sort of his research assistant was watch 50 movies and not just watch them once, but watch them over and over again. Um, and you know, break them down and sort of figure out what the structure was and how they were working, right? So, so that was like my crash course into story. Before that, I worked in the entertainment business. I read scripts. I was, you know, writing coverage and um, talking about scripts with people. But it wasn't until I did that and had that sort of like immersion into just the rhythm of stories that I really, I felt like I sort of you know, absorbed it and it was like in my bones after that. Um, so that was a great experience. And I think that that is, that was my first, um, or not my first, but that was probably the, um, the biggest impact on my understanding of story. Wow, that's really cool. So would he give you a list of movies to, to watch? Oh yeah, oh. so uh, in the second book, there are 50 movies that are broken down, um, sort of beat by beat and, um, so I think overall we watched more than 50 because you know 50 made the final cut, but it was it was watching the movie once just to sort of you know let it wash over you, and then it was watching again, paying attention to structure, and then it was watching again, taking notes and trying to figure out like okay, is this sort of time wise, is this kind of where the act ends, and is this where it escalates, and things like that, and and trying to like really make sure that we understood it. Uh, so each of those movies I watched at least three times. Um, and that was, I think, if you if you want to um, sort of have an understanding of the rhythm of storytelling, that's a great exercise. Just sit in your apartment for several months, watch movies nonstop, watch the same movie over and over again, because you'll you'll just sort of like absorb it, you know. Was there one or two of the films of those fifty that was really? It was just a little bit difficult to grasp the structure and some of the things around it. Oh yeah, I mean, I think Crash was a tough one to break down because it's it's not traditional, right? It's um, It has a, a three act structure, but because it follows different storylines, it makes it harder to kind of like follow that one through line all the way through, right? Obviously. Um, but so that was that was probably one of the harder ones to, to figure out how were they making this work in a way that felt like it was all one story that had sort of a beginning, middle and end, yet we were being told this one story through three separate storylines or three or four, I can't remember. And then when you would watch these these different movies, I know you said they were more than 50, would you write coverage on them? No, so, um, well, I take that back. It, it wasn't coverage like we think of coverage, but I was writing kind of the um, the structure breakdowns of them. Like here's the you know opening image, here's, the, here's what happens in the setup, here's the inciting incident, all that stuff. And how long would, would each like movie be? Oh, probably pages? three pages. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Wow. yeah. A little synopsis of the story. <laughs> yeah. Can you tell us how you met Blake Snyder? Oh, sure. Um, I My first job in LA was working for a manager producer as an assistant. And Blake was a friend of his. And so he would just come in the office and 
uh, was such a friendly, genuine person that he, of course, made time to talk to me, the assistant, uh, before he would go in and, and have a meeting. And so um, I got to know him over time, and he was very supportive of writers in general and of me being interested in screenwriting. Um, and so when he wrote his first book, he um, gave it to me to sort of beta read and give him my thoughts and tell him if it was useful. And, um, and I think I still have that, that, caught, that original copy. Uh, and then when he decided to write the second book, he asked if I would sort of come be his research assistant. So then that's when I started watching all of the movies for him. Wow, any, any memories, anecdotes, just from just seeing how he worked? Um, gosh. Not that I can share. Oh, okay. <laughs> no, sure, <I'm> sure. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. Um, no, he's, uh, I think the lasting memory that I have of Blake is just that he was so enthusiastic about story. So if I ran an idea by him for a script that I wanted to write, he would instantly, you know, latch onto it and get excited um, and, you know, start pitching ideas. And that enthusiasm, I think, is what sort of set him apart because he, you know, you could even be sort of lukewarm about your own idea, but his enthusiasm would make you fall in love with it and excited to write it, so. And did you think that his books would have such an impact? I mean, there's so many great books out there, but his is like in, a, in another yeah. stratosphere in terms of the reach? Yeah, I, I remember reading the first book and, um, and he, one of the things that he wanted to know was, do you think this is useful? Do you think writer, writers will be able to use this? And I remember thinking like, this is amazing. I can't, I can't imagine anyone not being able to get something out of this. So I think just the way he sort of simplified and distilled you know, the same things that we all talk about with three act structure. And um, you know, he really, he really took the idea of three act structure and sort of made it accessible um, and easy to understand, even if you're just starting to learn about story structure or screenwriting in general. Um, so I think that that is what makes his books, you know, lasting and have such a big impact on people. Great. Yeah, I yeah, know he even wrote a letter to David back in, was it 2008 yeah. oh, yeah. or 2009? It was so cool. Yeah. yeah. Because in the book, he says, like, just send me your log line. Right? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I know. And then he actually got back. I was so like cool. Was like, holy cow, this, you know, he got back. To yeah. Me, so. It's I funny. Remember. People yeah. still people still submit log lines to that email address. Oh, wow. Yeah. yeah. And does, does anyone answer it? Or uh, no? Usually I do. Yeah. <laughs> oh, okay. Wow. Yeah, because yeah. it's still, I mean, it's still going. It's its, yeah. its own. It's kind of like the artist's way. It's going to yeah. always yeah. kind of be in there. I mean, the people ether. love it. It's, you know, I, it's controversial at times, sure. right? Like there are some yeah. people that think it's too formulaic or whatever. I think that those people are sort of not, are sort of missing the spirit of it a little yeah. bit. Yeah. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I mean, people rave about it still and, that are yeah. just finding it now, so. What is story testing? Uh, well, the way I think about story testing is um, sort of asking a few questions of your story before you get into writing the draft, just to make sure you have kind of the foundation of it and all the pieces working together the way they should be before you invest a bunch of time in writing the pages of that script. Can someone call themselves a writer if they're only writing coverage? Wow, that's a good question. Um, yeah, I think you can consider yourself a writer because you're writing coverage. So um, I think that I think people are writers if they enjoy writing, want to write, and do any form of writing. Well, that was actually my next question. And can someone, uh, or does someone have to love the screenwriting process to be a great screenwriter? Oh, I don't think so. <laughs> I've heard too many professional screenwriters uh, talk about how painful it is to birth a story <laughs> to, and to actually make themselves sit down and write a script. You know, I, I think you hear people talk about it sort of across the spectrum. Some people love it and can't wait to get lost in the story, can't wait to sit down and just, you know, immerse themselves in whatever world they're creating. But I think that there are also, you know, people on the other end who um, maybe they love stories and they love filmmaking and they love putting the idea for a film on, on the page, but the process of writing is not always fun, not always easy, right? Yeah, it's funny, I was just watching um, an old video with the screenwriter of Quiz Show and, oh, uh, the one, it's like a new series, Tommy, I guess mm -hmm. it's on CBS, and he used to be like a, a critic, or I don't know, he worked for the Washington Post, and he said now, you know, 
this was an older video, so now he's a writer and how hard it was and how he didn't realize screenwriting is really difficult. And, you know, you look at his films and they're effort, you know, it seems like effortless writing, mm -hmm. but it, it's just interesting to see that so much goes into if you change one part, then you've got to go in and, and yeah. change the back. And do you think people realize that when they when they see these films and they go, oh, I can do that? No, <laughs> I think actually if you uh, if you enjoy movies and you not necessarily you don't necessarily want to be a screenwriter, but you enjoy movies, um, it's useful to try to write a script because it'll give you even more appreciation for what's gone into that movie being made and just the the you know all of the writing that had to happen to create that world and those characters and that story before you know before it even got to your theater. So um, I actually think that's a good exercise for people who love movies. Well, I have a log line, and it's not very good, and I was I want to run it by you <laughs> okay. and, and poke holes through it. Okay, so I just, um, I'm hoping we can deconstruct it. It's not very clear, and maybe you can help me clean it up. So a well-meaning librarian helps a prison writing group falling head over heels for someone entirely outside of her circle of friends and peer group, teaching her the meaning of true love. I know it sounds very cool. cliche, but anyway, <laughs> so it, is, it's too long? Is it too confusing? What's, yeah, what's wrong um, well, I, I don't think it's necessarily too long. Um, if you need that many words to convey the story, then you need that many words. But, um, but I will say the thing that I think is a little bit confusing about it is it felt like it jumped from one story to another. Um, so if I were going to help you workshop it, I would ask you who your, who's your protagonist? Uh, the librarian, she's, okay. she's um, you know, highly educated, came from, you know, maybe a liberal world, but more of a privileged world. And she works um, in this library where um, they have a writing group and some of the individuals there um, have uh, been, you know, incarcerated and now they've come out. And what are we watching for sort of the bulk of the movie? Are we watching her work with writers or are we, uh, there was another part to the log line that I've forgotten now, but... Was it before she fell in love, there was something else? Um, I think well-meaning, yeah, I had said that. So maybe it shows her life um, wanting to be involved in like community activism and things like that. I thought there was a part about her uh, going outside of her circle of friends. Oh yeah, good point. Um, she, she, no, no, this is great, she does. And so she has very, she's kind of from this like literati, you know, very, very like upscale, you know, discussing ideas, um, maybe college professors and people mm -hmm. like that in her circle of friends. Well, I think that that part you can probably leave out of the of the log line because it sounds like the movie that you're pitching is actually about this um, maybe somewhat privileged uh, liberal librarian, well-meaning librarian who is working with a bunch of incarcerated writers, right? So that's kind of the the main gist of your movie is that does that sound right? Yeah, and okay. maybe she's imprisoned by that world, and no pun intended, because she feels like she's got to still keep in competition with her peer group. Okay, um, that may or may not fit in the logline. So I, what I usually tell people is that we want to focus on just the foundation elements that that you need to tell your story. Start there, and then you can sort of like zhuzh it up to add add color and detail if you're pitching it. Um, but I would start with the protagonist, the story goal, so that main thing that she's trying to accomplish by the end of the movie, um, the main force of antagonism or opposition, and then some indication of the stakes is usually helpful, right, so that we understand why we should care about that story. So I start with those four things, and then I will say that there's like a stealth fifth element <laughs> that you can include that sometimes makes it easier to convey the the real sort of meat of your story, right? So if, um, just for example, if her story goal is to, um, you know, I don't know, I think you said something about win the love of somebody, is that? Oh, um, she falls in love with someone that's been incarcerated and this individual is way outside of like her social circle and what she would consider in a mate. Okay. And she just can't help herself. Okay. If that's not the A story, that might not belong in the log line either. But so I would say that whatever her story goal is, so whether it's to, you know, get this writing group uh, published in a national magazine or whether it's to um, get, f oh, let's go with this one. Let's say that her, her ultimate story goal is she starts working with these writers and her goal is to get funding to keep this uh, program going because it's going to be canceled, right? 
So if that's her ultimate story goal, just putting that in the log line doesn't necessarily tell us what we're watching over the course of this movie, right? Which is, that's the entertainment value. We wanna know, like, when we go see this movie, what are we in for? So, um, so that fifth stealth element that I was talking about is sometimes the method or the strategy that the protagonist is going to use to achieve that goal, because sometimes that gives us more of an indication of what's the actual movie that we're watching, right? So if her goal is to save this writing program, you know, saying um, a well-meaning librarian works, or a well-meaning librarian strives to save the incarcerated uh, prisoner's writing program at her local prison, that doesn't actually tell us what we're watching. So if you include the method, then it's something like a well-meaning liberal librarian uh, begins working with incarcerated women to put their stories on the page um, in order to save the writing program at their prison, something like that. That doesn't really give us a sense of the opposition or the conflict, but it gives you kind of a start with some of those story elements, if that makes sense. Sure, sure. Yeah. I guess, um, and this is where I'm not being clear, is that she falls in love, it's actually a man, but it oh, could be okay. a woman. <laughs> yeah, it, um, uh, that, um, is not is not what she thought Prince Charming would be, and mm -hmm. she's been looking for this Prince Charming okay. when this individual is right here, and he doesn't tick all the boxes that she thought. Okay. So it's more about her sort of journey as being um, in this group. She's a librarian. She's sort of an expert in her field, but then she falls head over heels for someone that she never expected that she would, and it causes a backlash for her. Got it. So interestingly, in when you read the logline, I thought that the main thrust of the story was her work with, or his work with these incarcerated writers. But the way you're describing it now, it sort of seems like maybe the A story is really the romance. Is it about the yeah. relationship? Okay. Yeah, I think it's, it's her coming out of her shell and being with someone that she never thought she could fall in love okay. with. Okay, well, so in that case, I would totally change the logline and I would say it would be something, because the, then really, her work with the writers is just the setup. It's just the situation that gets her to meet this guy, essentially. Does that sound right? Yeah, that's it. Mm -hmm. So um, so I would say um, after taking a new position, working with incarcerated writers, a well-meaning but, give me another descriptive word. Oh, man. Sheltered, um, naive. Yeah, sheltered, okay. right. Like a <laughs> well-meaning but sheltered librarian uh, falls in love with uh, the most unlikely, I don't know, um, the, the most unlikely suitor. Okay. Uh -huh. um, and pursues a relationship with him, even though he's uh, so far outside of her social circle that, I don't know, something else that happens in the story so that we get the sense that it's a Romeo and Juliet type of story, right? Where there's like incompatibility on the, on the surface, but they, they sort of have some sort of bond, right? That, that, Connects them. Does that yeah. sound right? Mm -hmm. um, so really, we get the sense that in that in that logline, we want to understand that what we're watching in this movie is really about this relationship between these two mismatched people. Exactly. But the fact that um, their their connection, their the strength of their connection, makes this a love story worth watching. Basically, so that's what we're trying to get in the logline. Right. Does that make sense? It, that does. Okay. And I just realized it, it it this mirrors the movie White Castle. I think with Susan Sarandon and James Spader. Oh, I, have, I don't think I've seen. Oh, that. it's so good. Oh. Yeah, and so and and where, but it's flip flop in that James Spader is the one that's from more of the privileged um, environment, and Susan Sarandon is like the single mom that's older, and she's brought to this like party, and everyone just is totally quiet, like, mm. <gasps> and yeah. and just the tension in the room, and it's so awesome. Yeah, because what we because the real main conflict of your story is about the fact that these two you know, shouldn't have fallen in love, but did, right? And so it's about them trying to make their relationship work despite all of their differences and the unlikeliness of their relationship. Is that yeah, right? Yeah, that's it. Yeah, so that's, that's what it. we want to get in the log line. <laughs> so then if I were to clean it up, because mine is a mess and it's all over the place, just um, a well-meaning librarian teaches a, a prison writing group? Well, so I would probably start with the fact that she has that position teaching prisoners, um, because that's that's really just the setup. You just want to get that sort of like, this is the situation that gets her into this bigger situation, which is the what the movie is about, right? So I would probably start with, um, after taking a position teaching incarcerated writers, 
a well-meaning but sheltered librarian uh, forms an unlikely relationship with a guy from the wrong side of the tracks or however you want to characterize him. I don't know if he's like the if, if he's another prisoner or prison warden or whatever. He, he's done he's done his time and he's okay. out and um he's he's done what he thinks to make amends. Okay. So uh, I would say forms an unlikely relationship with um with a guy with an ex-con mm -hmm. and um, trying to figure out how to characterize the the nature of that main conflict, which would be, and um, you know, they they embark on uh, forms an unlikely connection with a with an ex con, and they embark on a whirlwind romance that tests both of their preconceived notions about love and the way to live your life or something like that. Right, okay. <laughs> yeah. I like You'll that. have to switch out those elements to, to be true to your story, but that's kind of like the structure of it that I would go for. So. That's excellent. Yeah, I love it. And if we were to be to come up with a title for mm -hmm. it, which I haven't, okay. um, where would we go with a title to, would it be someone's name? Would it just be, you know, um, I, I don't know. That's a good question. And I... <laughs> I dislike titles. I dislike coming up with titles. But uh, what I usually tell people is that if you're writing a spec script, um, be more clear than clever in your title because I need to be able to hear that title again and remember what script that was, you know? So a good example or a good exercise actually is if you read the, um, the titles and the log lines for the scripts on the blacklist, and then put that list away for a week and come back to it and just read the titles. See if you can remember what log lines, you know, which log lines went with which titles. If you can't, then that's not a useful title to me as a person who's trying to remember which scripts I've read and what that script was about when somebody wants to ask me about it, you know? Um, does that make sense? It does. So you said clever should be the last thing in a title. I, I mean, I think cleverness in a title is great and sometimes that can make it catchy and that can make it, you know, have a sticky quality that, that will help you remember what that script was. But if it's like, for example, if you're writing um, a biopic about Seaberg, right? Right. Uh -huh. Just call it Seaberg so that I can remember, when I see that title again, I'll remember exactly what that script was, you know? Okay, I understand. Right, <laughs> what, what, and not try to do something you know, the, the, the French temptress or, well, she wasn't yeah. French, but she ended up living <laughs> yeah. in France. Yeah. Yes. So, okay. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know if that's useful to you at all, but. No, it is. It is. Um, and do you think with titles, the, 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 um, uh, less is more in terms of words? Oh, I haven't actually thought about that mm. directly, but, um, I mean, I guess if you can convey what your script is about in fewer words, that's probably better. I won't say that's a hard and fast rule, but sure. that's probably better. Okay. Well, thank well, you for this log line, by the way. <laughs> well, I will say that in a in a title, though, sometimes the sometimes you do get a, a title that's long on purpose, and that's what makes it memorable. You know what I mean? Right. Um, Three billboards out of Ebbing, <laughs> outside of Ebbing Missouri. Right. <laughs> right. Yeah. I mean, like that. Nobody's going to forget when they see. They may not remember the title off the top of their heads, but when they see it, they will remember what that movie is. So I don't know. I guess I, there's no there's no uh, hard and fast rules there. No right answers, no wrong answers. What are three mistakes screenwriters make with log lines? Well, the three that I tend to see are um, stopping at the setup. So describing just the, you know, the initial situation uh, and not really giving us any indication of what happens in the, the meat of the movie, if, if that makes sense. Um, so, you know, often when we come at stories, we, we come with an interesting what if. And that's a great, you know, entry point into a story, but then you, you sort of have to develop that, that continuation of, of the conflict, right? Like what's the real problem that they're trying to solve? Um, in a log line, if you just give me the setup, I don't know if you've thought that through, if you've um, come up with the story part of your, of your screenplay, I know that you've come up with a situation, but not necessarily a story. So that's the first um, mistake that I see people make with log lines. Um, the second one is um, is not having an act two, which is a little bit different than the first one. Uh, if you are conveying to me what's happening in your movie, but it's something sort of transitory or that can be done in you know one scene or or one minute, then that raises a little bit of a red flag because um, 
then it feels like maybe you don't have enough to sustain an entire movie. Um, and then the third mistake that I see a lot is um, packing too much detail into your log line. So, you know, usually this happens after somebody has written the script and so they know so much about the story and they've fallen in love with everything that they've written that then they try to write, they try to distill all of that down into one sentence and it's really hard because they have all these details that they know and all these, you know, subplots and supporting characters and character arcs and all these, all this stuff. And so um, they'll try to jam all of that into one sentence and then that just makes it confusing and we want that log line to ultimately to just really convey a solid sense of what that movie is that we'll be watching if we sit down in the theater, right? So we need to know like what's that main conflict, that big conflict that we're gonna be tracking over the course of that movie and have a sense of the, the nature of the action that we're watching on screen. So what are, what are the you know sort of broad strokes things that that character is doing in pursuit of that story goal? Um, that's really what you're trying to get into the log line. And like I always say, you can start with those sort of four foundational elements, your protagonist, the story goal, the antagonist or main force of opposition, and the stakes. Start there, write one sentence with those elements, and that should give you a really good start for your logline. You may need to add a few details, but that way you're starting with a solid foundation and then you can add details as necessary rather than you know starting by putting everything you know about the story into a sentence and then trying to pull things out. So going back to uh, the logline example that we did, and I don't know whether this video will come out before the other one, oh, yeah. so um, people might be confused by what I'm referring to, but the logline that I gave you was definitely confusing and there was too much in it. So we cleaned it up and we found out that it wasn't just about the writing group, it was more about her finding love. Yeah. So that was getting to the meat of it. Yeah, because I think if you were gonna if you were going to write that script, it sounded like what the story that you wanted to tell was really about this mismatched romance, right? Yeah. And so that's what we want to convey in the log line because then when I read the script or I watch the movie, that's the movie that I'm getting. You're not you're not telling me um, that uh, dangerous minds story, <laughs> you know. <Right. laughs> you're you're telling me the the English patient or whatever. And yeah. so those are you know both both movies that work, but but I want to know which one I'm getting before I pick up that script or before I go see that movie. So making sure that you convey a true sense of the story that you want to tell in that log line, that's, you know, that's what we're looking for. What situation will a screenwriter use log lines? When will this come up? Well, I think there are a few different situations. Um, you know, in the classes that I teach, we usually start with log lines as sort of the first iteration of your story. So just like you and I were talking about trying to figure out what's that, what's the story that you actually want to write, um, we use log lines as a way to kind of figure that out. Like, what is this story that you're trying to tell? Um, in that case, I think that, you know, it's, we put much more of the focus on getting those essentials of the story into the log line so that it's, um, we can tell if that foundation is solid before we start developing the story further. Uh, but you might also use a logline in a query letter or to pitch to somebody in person, um, you know, that, that elevator pitch of your story. So if you're using that version of a logline, you're probably going to think uh, a little bit more carefully about the language that you use because it's not just for internal use anymore. You're actually presenting this as, you know, this is the product essentially that I'm trying to pitch you. So you'll probably be a little bit more careful about word choice and a little bit um, more conscious of getting of really conveying the tone of the story and sort of that that feel of the movie, if you can, through the word choice and through um, just the language and the way you're describing the situation. I'm sorry, can you explain foundation? I know that's jumping a little bit uh, oh, yeah. off topic, but. No, the, um, when I talk about the foundation, that's just me referring to kind of those essential building blocks of your story. So the, the protagonist, the story goal, the antagonist or opposition and the stakes. Like those are the things that every story needs, you kind of have to have those elements. And so that's where I start if uh, I'm helping someone figure out what, you know, what story they're telling or figure out what's not working about their story. You just have to start with the foundation layer and then, and then work your way up, right? So make sure that that's solid and then we can talk about the other pieces that go into making your story work. So what if someone says, well, I don't have a really strong antagonist, but I have a great sidekick character. Is it because there's no opposition? There's nothing that this hero needs to overcome? Yeah, that could be. <laughs> that would be my first instinct is if someone says they're writing a story that doesn't have an antagonist, um, I would. it wouldn't be 
necessarily a, you know, a deal breaker, but I would want to know where is that conflict coming from, right? Because if you are telling a story where sort of nothing goes wrong, it's probably going to be either a pretty short story or we're just going to get bored pretty quickly. (laughs) So I would want to know, I I would question, where is that conflict coming from? If it's not, if it's not a sort of, you know, traditional, like direct conflict that we can see between two people or a person in a group or, you know, that type of thing, then, then what is making this um, journey for your protagonist so difficult and, or so interesting, you know? How does a screenwriter determine the why of telling their story? I mean, do they need to know exactly why writing this is important to them? Hmm. That's a good question. I I think that I would not say someone has to know why writing their story is important to them, um, only because I feel like that puts puts so much pressure on people, and especially beginning writers often are really um, intimidated by trying to say something profound or new and unique with their stories. So um, I I think maybe a better exercise is to, before you dive into actually writing something and you get into that sort of long slog of, of writing and rewriting, uh, I think a useful exercise is to get in touch with your sort of spark of inspiration about an idea. So that might be why writing this story is so important to you. That could be what inspires you about it, but it might just be, you know, I've always loved mysteries and I want to write something that is really twisty and turny and hard for people to solve. And I think that's enough. Like that, you don't have to um, not all of us are writing highbrow <laughs> type stories, you know? I think there's something totally valid about writing great entertaining stories, and maybe what draws you to that isn't, um, isn't something profound or, you know, uh, contributing something profound and new thinking to the world, but it's just uh, a desire to entertain people. Okay. Does great. that make sense? Yeah, okay. it does. It does. So you can, you can do Dark Waters, which I don't know if you saw that movie. It's I didn't, fantastic. I've oh, yeah. heard about it, yeah. It's fantastic. Or you could do something light and fluffy, and each one is going to have its own audience and, yeah. and reason for wanting to do it. Not everybody wants to go to a dark place. Right, Some right. people just want to have fun and keep it light. And, and also, I mean, I think that um, if you, you know, if, if, you, if you're learning about story, maybe... If you're learning screenwriting, maybe don't put so much pressure on yourself to write like your ultimate perfect screenplay first. Don't write the don't write like the the passion project first. Maybe um, it might be a good exercise to choose a story that's a, a little bit more straightforward that you find entertaining, but not necessarily. Um, you know, if I write this, this will be my great American screenplay <laughs> type of thing. Um, just to learn the mechanics of a screenplay and how to put a story together. And that can be a good learning exercise, I think. Um, and in that case, you know, um, the thing that inspires you about that story might just be like, oh, I, I knew this interesting person once and I want to put them in a crazy situation. So, you know, I think we come at stories from different directions. So maybe save that one that's like that deep, that one that's just until you really feel like you, you've mastered the craft in some sense, or you know what the rules are, so you can kind of bend them? Or... Well, I think that, um, you know, I hesitate to, to tell people to write something or not write something, because sometimes that passion is what you need to get you through the writing, right? So if it's, a, if it's the story that you've been passionate about your whole life, and you're just now getting to, you know, your opportunity to write it down, then go for it. I, I'm not going to stop anyone from writing their passion project. Sure. But, um, but I do think that um, for some people, the pressure to write like the perfect screenplay, especially to write that one screenplay that's going to be kind of the epitome of everything they hoped to put into a story, you know, I think that's a lot of pressure. So, um, you know, I, I think write with the wind at your back. <laughs> If somebody really wants to write a story and it's just like they have to get it out of them, it's mm-hmm. consuming them, do they need to know why they, they, they want to tell it or, or just the fact that it's consuming them is enough? Oh, uh, yeah. I think the fact that, that, that it's consuming them, I think that's a great place to start, right? Because you sort of need that energy and that passion to, to carry you through the writing process. Um, I think probably as they write, they will discover what makes that that particular story important to them. Um, 
a lot of times I think that you know we can get uh, inspired by an interesting idea for a story, and then over the course of developing it, we can get in touch with the meaning behind the story and sort of what we want to say with it, um, or as you might call it, the theme of the story, right? So I think it's totally okay to start working on a story not really knowing what you're trying to say with it and to find that over time because um, that will happen. Like as you get in touch with who the protagonist is, what their journey is through the story, what transformation they're going through, the effect that these events are having on them, that will help you get in touch with what the meaning of the story is. So then someone doesn't really have to know like where does this fit into my personal history or how I look at life. It's just if I have this spark in me that wants to tell it, you think that's enough? Yeah, I think so because I think that um, you can, you know, you can come at a, at a story a lot of different ways. You might just want to entertain, and that's great. I think that that's a totally valid reason to write a to write a screenplay, right? Um, you may also have a passion project, something that you've been fascinated by or that you've been carrying with you your whole life and you're finally getting around to putting it down on paper. And I think that that's a valid reason to write a story too. So, um, you know, I think maybe key to this is don't get intimidated by trying to say something deep and profound right away. It's okay if you're coming at a story just because this situation or this character fascinates you, um, makes you laugh, you know, makes you excited, makes you curious, whatever. That's, that's a totally valid way to come at a story. Um, and then, you know, if you are worried about um, finding the meaning or finding the reason behind the story, I think that you will find that as you develop um, kind of all of the elements of the story, the protagonist and what they're going through. Uh, and what that, the way the story changes them will convey the, the theme or the meaning, that takeaway message of the story. How should a writer start a screenplay? I think if you want to write a screenplay, you should take the path of least resistance. So start the screenplay however feels easiest and most fun to you, right? Um, if you don't know where to start, I think a good place to start is with just a brain dump. So I think sitting down with whether it's you know notebook and pen or on your laptop or whatever, and just writing down everything you know about the story. And it doesn't even have to be stuff that you know that happens in the story. It can be things that you like about this type of movie. So I love horror movies because they scare the pants off of me and they make me grab my boyfriend's arm or whatever it is. You can write all of that stuff down. That's all part of like what you're going to try to get into your project, right? So everything that inspires you about it, maybe why you wanna write it, maybe um, the last movie you saw that felt sort of like you would like your movie to feel, uh, movies that inspire you. And then also in that same document, I would also try to put everything that you do know about the story. So. Uh, the idea that I have is about this guy and this is his backstory and these are his friends and this is the situation he finds himself in and I don't know where this goes but he encounters some sort of swamp monster and you know stream of conscious consciousness just brain dump I think that's the great place to start your story for two reasons one because it gets you um, to kind of like download your spark of inspiration right which is really useful later on when you're feeling bored and tired of your story you can revisit that document and remember like what was it like when i fell in love with this story um, and then the second reason is that you can actually pull a lot of the sort of elements that you need to start building your story from that document so if you said i know it's about this guy who you know grew up in texas that's probably your protagonist, right? So that gives you one of your elements. And you can sort of start circling the things that you've written down that you may not have known were important yet, but you can start using those elements to build your story from. So that's where I, that's where I think everyone should start. If they don't know where to start, um, start with a brain dump. And is that a natural part of, of being close to a screenplay for a long time is you will get bored and tired of it, but that doesn't mean you need to abandon it? Yeah, I think... Um, I, I can't remember if I've ever met a writer who didn't say <laughs> at some point or another they got tired of the project they were working on. The, you know, one of the most common things that I hear people say is, I can't look at the script anymore, <laughs> so I need a fresh set of eyes on it, right? So um, I think it's totally natural, totally common to be, you know, because the writing process is so much longer than you think it's going to be. Usually, for the most part, every script that you work on is going to take more drafts than you expect. Um, and you know they may not be full rewrites or full drafts, but there's always 
one more thing that, oh, if I connected these elements, that would you know, give it more meaning, or if I went through and tweaked the dialogue of this person, that would give them more, you know, more characterization or whatever. So there's always more to do. Um, so the writing process is always longer than you think it's going to be. Uh, so I think that, yes, that's very common to fall out of love with your project at some point or another, probably multiple times. Um, and that's why it's really useful to kind of crystallize your spark of inspiration at the very beginning so that you can revisit it later, you know, when you are feeling low about it and feeling like, oh, why did I ever start this? You know, you can go back to that initial, like, true love feeling. If we take novel writing, so we're going to be spending a lot of detail on setting a world, but if we are doing a screenplay, are we really how much are we really paying attention to like the where, the, the setting mm. of it, the scenes? Because won't some of that be fleshed out when the actual film starts and the director storyboards or whatever? Yeah, um, I mean, I think that it is important to pay attention to the where of your story, right? Um, because every choice that you make in your screenplay should be a deliberate one. So if you've chosen a setting, there should have been some reasoning behind that. You're not going to set your love story about um, you know, working with incarcerated writers. You're not going to set that in a juvenile detention center. Maybe. No. You're, you want it to be in, you know, in a very specific sort of like type of prison to inform that world, right? Um, so I think that you should pay attention to the where. Um, if we're talking about the, the, the process of actually conveying that on the page, um, I think that you know, the trick of screenwriting right, is to be as concise as possible, but as evocative as, possi as possible in those few words. So, um, so that's the trick of conveying it on the page, is um, being deliberate about your choice and then conveying it as specifically as possible so that you can get as much out of your choice as you can. Does that make sense? It does. So fade in, if we're talking about, let's say, this library, this hypothetical, mm -hmm. fade in. That's where I'm having, how much detail okay. am, I, am I using? Um, yeah, well, so early in your screenplay, you probably, um, because you're just introducing us to the world of your story, you'll probably take a little bit more time to convey where we are, uh, the, the feel and the tone of where we are, and maybe the important characteristics of that setting, right? Um, and then as your script progresses, you'll probably need to describe less, both because we're, we've probably already seen a lot of these locations, and then also because you want that you want your story to move fast, right? So as as you go further along in the screenplay, um, you'll probably spend less time establishing locations uh, than you did at the very beginning when you were trying to establish the world and create that world in our minds so that we could live in it for the duration of your story. Now that said, I, I think that there's, um, there's also value though in knowing which moments in your screenplay should breathe. And when you have a moment that you, that you need to sort of give space to, that might be when you bring us into the world for a little bit you know, longer of a moment with some extra detail or telling us what's going on in that scene or something like that. Does that make sense? It does, okay. yeah. Um, is that the same for when we're doing a character description in the beginning? Like if we use this hypothetical librarian, she's 35, uh, straight, blonde hair, um, maybe a little bit uh, dark under the eyes from staying up all night reading. Or yeah, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I just... <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Well, so uh, a lot of there's a lot of uh, emphasis put on those um, character introductions, right? I think we, um, I have two minds about this. I think that people get caught up in writing like the perfect character introduction. I think that they are important because the first time we meet your character, you want to give us a sense of who they are, sort of concisely and. Um, evocatively, right? Um, but, you know, I've seen some character introductions that, that, are, that are a little too long, that maybe like stop the story in order to give us a lot of information about the character the moment we meet them, um, which can be, you know, if you're reading a script, it can, it can really pull you out if you, if you are forced to stop the scene and meet this person. That feels like it interrupts the flow of the story, right? So I think that the trick of writing character introductions, again, is 
The same with, with all screenwriting, which is be as concise as you can, but as evocative as you can. Um, and what you're trying to convey when you introduce the character is give us that sort of like defining quality about them, that essence of the character that's going to be important to the story. So physical descriptions might not be as useful to us, right? Because we might, I mean, the blonde hair might never come into play in the story, right? But it might be useful to know that she's overworked or that she's burning the midnight oil or, you know, that might be important to the story and the situation that she finds herself in. So stuff like that could be useful. And you just have to sort of determine, like, what's the most um, sort of defining quality about this character that I need my reader to understand right now as I introduce them? Do you think the first scene or sort of sentence in a screenplay is as important the way maybe the first sentence in a novel would be? That's a good question. I haven't thought about it, but um, I would say no. <laughs> um, only because I think in a novel, well, I don't know. When you're reading a novel, you're going to give it more than one sentence, right? I mean, if, you're, if you've picked up a novel to read, you're, you're probably pretty interested in it already. Um, in a screenplay, I have heard, so it depends on the situation. Uh, if I am reading this entire script and I already know I'm reading it front to back, then that first sentence, if it's clunky, I'm, I'm going to give it a little bit of leeway. I'm going to give it another chance, right? So I'm going to keep reading regardless. Um, I have heard some people say that they can tell if they're going to keep reading a script from the first sentence. If they read the first sentence and they're not hooked or it feels like the person doesn't really know what they're doing, then they're going to put it down. I would say that's an extreme, <laughs> that's an extreme opinion. Um, but, you know, you also have to understand that if we're talking about a situation where you are submitting your script to be read by somebody in the industry, you're asking for their time, right? Um, how much time they're willing to give you is up to them. So the best thing you can do is make sure that every sentence of your screenplay is worth reading and makes them want to read the next one, right? That's, you have to set yourself up for success um, because there's no guarantee that they're going to read your whole script. That's fair. Right. Yeah. <laughs> and, and this is, by the way, you said you're, you're hearing this from producers or agents or whatever you've heard. This is not necessarily your opinion. Right. But it, it's just... Yes. I mean, I very rarely pick up a script just to read one sentence and see if I like it or not. Sure. Um, but, you know, it depends on the situation. So if, if someone is a... If someone's reading a lot of scripts, if they're vetting scripts for a producer, say, and they're just looking for something really great, they might they might only give it a page or two pages. They might, you know, um, back in the day when I was reading a lot of scripts for a producer, and so it wasn't I wasn't reading the scripts to try to give notes and help make them better. I wasn't working on a project. It was just vetting projects to see if there was anything interesting or worth reading the whole script. Um, you know, it wasn't uncommon to read the first act or even read to where the inciting incident should be and see if anything's happening. See if there's anything to like sort of catch my interest and make me want to keep reading this script. So um, I think if you're submitting your scripts to a producer or a manager, an agent, um, you should assume that you need to hook their attention, you know, at least in the first few pages, if not on the first page itself. And this goes back to the, the story that you said about being from Oregon and, you know, hey, how's it going when you're working <laughs> at a production company? Really, and then and, and when you called the Los Angeles area, it was more protocol for them to just kind of be like, yeah, what do you need? Yeah. Well-intentioned, I'm sure they are, but but it, that's how the tempo of, of the industry, and it wasn't to find out, you know, how your day was going. Yes, kind of exactly. The, the pace in L.A., that's what surprised me <laughs> when, you know, comparing Oregon to California. Uh, from Portland to L.A., the pace is definitely a lot faster, and that took some getting used to. Um, but yes, I think that speaks to, that's exactly right. Like, people working in the industry are short on time, and there's a lot of material to get through, and so you have to make your material grab them and, and make them want to keep reading, and that's, that's a challenge, you know. What are springboards and sequences? So I did not invent springboards and sequences, and unfortunately I can't remember where I picked this up, but I think it's a really useful thing when you're trying to figure out kind of that, um, well, it's really useful when you're trying to figure out act two, right? Because it allows you to break your story down into smaller chunks. So sequences, a lot of people have heard of. Um, 
you can think of your movie as sort of eight sequences. Um, two sequences in act one, four sequences in act two, two sequences in act three, right? So that's sort of the division of sequences across your three act structure. Um, it's, it's pretty common to look at movies in sort of that sequence structure. Uh, the springboards, I think, are the real bonus of, of this uh, exercise that I sort of help writers with, which is coming up with that, um, that event or turning point or plot point that ends one sequence and launches the next one. And that, it's just a way for you to sort of start planning out your story so that there's a real sense of cause and effect. And it breaks it down into manageable chunks when you are plotting or even when you're writing. Um, I do this and I, I teach this method, which is uh, to outline in sequences. So you only have to focus on one sequence at a time, which makes it less daunting to approach your, your entire story. If we were to look at Crash, and I know you said that that was one of the most difficult of the 50, or, or you know, yeah. great, awesome film, but yeah, in terms of the structure, what would be some of those springboards? That's a good question. I haven't actually seen Crash in so long oh, that, okay. <laughs> that it would be no, tough. I haven't either. It would be <laughs> tough. But, um, but I will say, if you're, if you're looking at sort of um, the way springboards and sequences overlay onto, onto the three-act structure, right? And it does. It, they, they line right up, and it's... Um, I'm certainly not saying that every movie has to have eight equal sequences across the movie, but this is just a method to help you to help you plot your story, uh, and you may deviate from this as you find your story, right? So every story is unique, and you have to serve that story, the story that you're telling, um, but it gives you a starting point. So if I, if I am coming at a story and I just really don't know anything yet, I start thinking in the springboards and sequences because that gives me sort of containers to think about what needs to happen in each section of the script. Um, and then as I find what needs to happen in each section, I might go, oh, well, I only need one sequence here, or I only need, you know, maybe I need three short sequences is here or whatever. But it just gives you a starting point to sort of break your story. Um, and then if you're, uh, we were talking about what, it, you know, what is a springboard and sort of where do they fall, um, your kind of big turning points naturally are springboards. So your inciting incident is your first springboard, right? So you have a sequence of your story that's going to be all set up, really, introducing your protagonist, establishing the world, all that stuff, what's their life like right now? And then that sequence will end in the inciting incident, which is a springboard that launches the next sequence. So because of that inciting incident, your protagonist now has some sort of problem or opportunity that they're going to have to deal with, right? And that is what sequence two is about. So it's like, what are they gonna do with this? How are they gonna contend with it? What happens if they don't deal with it? What's at stake, you know, all that stuff closing all those like sort of immediate doors to convince us that they're gonna take that act two journey. So you work through that sequence and then that ends in the next springboard, which is your break into two, right? So then you have a big sort of plot turn at that moment, which is usually your protagonist deciding, yes, I'm gonna go do this thing. Here's my plan for solving this big problem in my life. That's your springboard that launches you into sequence three. So. So the, the sort of um, springboard and sequences that we use as like a framework to start, of, to start figuring out your story really just lays on top of 3X structure and a lot of your major turning points that you have probably already thought of, those are gonna be springboards anyway. So if I was going to take, let's say, going back to this librarian with the with the bad boy um, boyfriend. I like this story. Should, <laughs> I know, keep I'm developing like this. more and more too, yeah. Um, <laughs> If she, let's suppose she's called into the administrator's office for the central library and they say, I need to have a seat. Uh, listen, um, we do not advocate um, dating uh, people that are within our programs here. And is that a springboard or her springboard would then be to make a decision? Let's suppose she's still allowed to keep her job, but she's been given a, like a reprimand and it's mm -hmm. going in her file. What part would actually be a springboard? Well, so um, I actually think it's both of those things. So it's the event that turns the story in a new direction or launches the next sort of sequence of events, but that is going to be led off by your character's reaction to that event. So it might be, um, you know, she she's sat down by her superior. They say, you have a choice. You can either um, keep your job or keep the guy. And then her reaction to that is, is really what we're watching over the next sequence. So that sequence is going to start with her probably making some sort of decision, right? Um, it'll probably probably be in the next scene, or it might not, um, but 
long story short, <laughs> the, the springboard would, would be the event, and then her reaction to it would be what, what we'd be tracking over the next sequence, probably. Right, okay, because let's say then she goes like on the subway and maybe she sees couples together mm -hmm. and she's kind of like sizing up like, hmm, is this where I fit into coupledom with like, you know, yeah. even though I've chosen someone that's maybe outside my circle of friends. Yeah, well, so that's actually a good example because I think that it, um, the, the options that you brought up, it could work both ways. So the springboard could be she sat down and told you have to make this choice and then the next sequence might be about us watching her make that choice, right? Or that the next sequence might be after she she walks out of that office knowing she's gonna ditch the job and, and go with the guy, then the next sequence might be her trying to convince him that they're in it together and there's no one else and whatever. You know what I mean? So right. it just kind of depends on your story. Um, that's why I said it's just a it's just a framework to sort of help us, you know, fig start breaking your story and think about like what needs to happen in each in each um, section of your story. Great. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Great. Yeah, this script is coming together and I didn't, I'm not even going to write it. <laughs> How do we know if the plot progression in a screenplay makes sense? Well, I mean, I think that there's, it's just common sense. You're going to, you're going to sort of like follow the logic of your story. Um, is that, is that what you mean? The yeah, plot logic? Yeah, I mean, do, do we, do, how do we, know? maybe I guess the better question is, what if the plot progression is taking too long? Uh, maybe, that's, maybe that's a better question. That's a good question. Like my question's taking too long, sorry. <laughs> no, 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 that's a good question. Um, so, so I think that that is subjective, right? And it depends on what you're going for. It depends on the story you're telling, the pace that you sort of expect from a story in that genre and that style. Um, so there's, there's no, you know, black and white answer, but, um, I do think that when you're reading a script, right, one of the one of the big red flags is boredom. So this might be something that you can only figure out once you have sort of figured out your your entire plot and you get fresh eyes on it. You might think, you know, that it moves like a runaway train and then you might have somebody else look at it and they say, "Oh gosh, when is it when's it going to get going? When's it going to start?" right? So, um I mean, I think that the uh, the sort of natural approach is to get your start, get your story moving as quickly as possible, and make sure that you are escalating the conflict and escalating the stakes consistently throughout your story, and um, and building on that throughout all of Act Two. But if you've done that and you've broken the story, you've plotted the whole thing out, you think it's great. I would still say get a fresh set of eyes on it so you can see if everyone else agrees with you and they think that your the pace is okay of your story as well. Right, because then there's, there's pacing that's too fast. Yeah, and that's what we were talking about with letting mo moments breathe too, right? right. Um, because we want to sort of see the emotional reactions of stories too. We don't, I mean, sometimes we do want just an action movie that just moves from action to action, right? Yeah. But more often, I think we're interested in what is the effect of this plot on this character? That's what we actually care about when we're watching a movie or reading a script, right? We wanna know, like, what is the experience like for this person going through this? What are they feeling? What are they thinking? How is this causing them to change or reprioritize what, what's in their life? Um, so I think it, yes, pace in a script can be too fast at times um, if it doesn't give us those, those moments of reaction and sort of you know, processing emotions so that we understand what's the emotional journey of this story as well, not just the plot. Great, yeah, and going back to like biopics, I think sometimes what they fall short in is the pacing's too fast because mm. they're trying to cram too much. Yeah. But, and I know we were just talking about Seberg off camera. I, I thought the pacing was great. So, but <laughs> well, I you have to see it. But yeah. Biopics yeah. are tough because um, I think a lot of times people try to make a story of someone's entire life, you know, or that maybe that's the instinct of like, this was such an iconic person. I want to tell the whole story of their entire life. And very few people's lives are actually one story, you know, <laughs> like most of our lives are episodic, right? So you have to pick what is the episode from your life that's a transformative, defining experience, and then tell that story. Don't, don't tell me the whole thing. Just give me the, that transformative experience. Great point, yeah. <laughs> and I think that's what it did for the most part, yeah. It didn't, it didn't totally follow her whole, her whole journey. What do screenwriters need to know about timelines? Yeah, I mean, I think that there's definitely, um, 
it's worth paying attention to the timeline of your story because there's a certain flow that when you're reading a script, if that, if the, if the sort of flow of logic or our sense of how much time is passing in the story, if that is off or, you know, unclear, that can be disorienting and can make reading it confusing. So definitely worth paying attention to. Um, it's, it's not a problem I see that often. But occasionally it does come up where I can't figure out, so if this event happened then, how much time has passed, you know? So um, I think that goes to clarity, which is one thing that you're always striving for in your script is conveying as clearly as possible exactly what, you know, exactly what the story is, what's happening, so that we can understand kind of the, the you know, the journey that you're taking us on. Yeah, I think it's hard too when there's like, they're jumping back and forth in someone's memory or they're, they're showing different people's realities. And so mm -hmm. that timeline becomes blurred, but yeah. I'm not sure the best way to convey that. Um, are you, are you working That's, different timelines into your librarian story? Uh, we could, we could try <laughs> that. Yeah. Okay. So if we were going to use that, <laughs> I know people are going to be like, okay, move on with the librarian. But if we, let's suppose we wanted the librarian to think back to growing up and maybe the perfect boy that her parents wanted her to marry and she just didn't want that. She wanted somebody that had more edges around them. Mm -hmm. So she kind of, maybe he was like the local business owner's son. He was like the perfect guy on paper, but there was nothing there for her. Yeah. And then she remembers like the bad kid and having a crush on this guy. Mm -hmm. And so that takes her back now to being 35 and working in this, you know, city library and she's, regarded amongst her peers, but she still has something for this yeah. sort of rough around the edges writer who's a little bitter yeah. and arms crossed and challenges her, but she likes that. Yeah. Well, I have a couple of thoughts about this story. <laughs> okay, so, um, no, so I think it's great. So, um, so I would say you're, um, you are sort of talking about flashbacks, right? Which is a, which right. is a topic worth talking about. Um, I think that flashbacks you can use. I know a lot of people say, don't use flashbacks. They're, you know, outlawed or whatever. You can totally use flashbacks if we need that information to understand the story that we're watching in the present time. You know what I mean? Um, if it gives me context that I need in order to appreciate, understand, feel whatever the story is that you're telling me right now, then I think it's valid. Um, I would say in that case, I don't necessarily need to know that she had a crush on a bad boy in her childhood in order to understand the attraction to the bad boy today, right? Because I think that's a pretty common thing, pretty common trope for romances, right? That women like bad boys. So I would say because everyone already gets that, you don't have to explain it to us by saying she had this past that where she had a crush on a bad boy. Um, also, just in general, I would say with romance stories, um, try to keep just one love interest unless you have, unless they're directly competing, right? And so you have like a sort of a love triangle or something like that, um, which is very common as well. But if, if we're introduced to someone else that she was in love with, and then now we're supposed to invest in her being in love with this person, that can get a little bit muddy and sort of divide our our loyalties, like who do we want her to be with, right? Which is exactly the the effect that you want with a love triangle. But in this instance, I, you're not you're not talking about a love triangle. You're talking about a, a backstory that is informing her um, romantic ideal today. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I was just thinking. So that wouldn't really be a competing timeline. That's more just just a memory, yeah. like a flashback sequence. Right. I okay. mean, I think that um, there there definitely are stories that maybe could be told in parallel timelines, right? And if we're going to take the librarian example one step further, so maybe there is a um, maybe there is a timeline of when she was ten years old, and I I don't know. Actually, I don't think there is. But okay, <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say in some stories there are parallel timelines, or you know, uh, two different sort of stories that are happening in different timelines. I'm trying to think, like The Hours, I think, was one. Okay, right. right. Do you uh -huh. remember that movie? Yeah. Um, it was like three different timelines sure. in one story. And so they chose to do that. I guess the, the point that I'm making is they chose um, 
to tell the story across different timelines for a deliberate effect. So that really is the goal before you make any um, sort of style or structural choices is understanding what is the effect that you're trying to have on the audience. Um, and so then how do I achieve that effect, right? So if I'm trying to um, draw out some mystery about why she's in love with this guy, then maybe I want another, you know, a series of flashbacks alluding to some, you know, romance that she had years and years ago or something like that. Maybe that could be effective. But but the point being that um, I would I would only make that choice knowing that I want to have this effect on the audience. I want them to be curious about how did this woman get to be this way. And so then that's the effect that I would be trying to achieve with those flashbacks. Does that make sense? It does, okay. yeah. <laughs> so maybe she remembers going to the dance with the good guy and then she saw the bad boy smoking outside mm -hmm. and he makes like he makes like a snide comment to her but there's part of like this he's also like fishing at the same time and so she kind of remembers you mm. know Tommy in his tux or whatever you I don't know, know. <laughs> <laughs> I will say the danger of that and this is this again goes back to clarity which is um, you have to understand what your audience is going to see when they see that flashback are they going to know that that's a different bad boy than the one you're presenting us with today, right? So we might be watching it and going like, oh, they've met before. She she actually had a crush on him when she was a teenager, right? And that could change how we understand your story. Um, it could also just confuse us and That's <laughs> true. make us yeah. wonder like, what, what is it with this woman and yeah. this guy? I don't know <laughs> right. what's happening with them. So yeah. That's a good point. So maybe that's too much backstory. Could be, yeah, yeah it could be. Also, mm -hmm. also, I will say, if you if you are writing that story and you want to put that backstory in, could be something that you don't need a flashback for, and you can just get in through you know conversation or something like that. Ah, okay, maybe like um, having drinks with an old college friend or something. Right. Something said. Right. Because it feels like that piece of information is fairly small. So is it worth stopping the story, flashing back to a completely different time, a completely different cast of characters, except your protagonist, just to let us know that she sort of always had a thing for bad boys, you know? That's something that you can probably get out in, you know, a line of dialogue. Sure, sure. Like a bartender walks by and she <laughs> says like, you know, I'll take a martini from him or so. I don't know. That's, so, that's way too cliche. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> What do writers get wrong about writing supporting characters? Oh, um, well, I don't know that they necessarily get it wrong, but I think one thing that could make some supporting characters stronger and screenplays in general stronger is connecting the supporting characters to the theme a little bit more. Um, I think sometimes writers throw in, you know, the wacky sidekick or, you know, the, a supporting character who's just really colorful and there for comedic effect or you know, a, a sort of a distraction from the A story. But really, you want your screenplay to be a collection of things that are all having the same conversation, right? So you want your screenplay to be having one conversation all the way through, and all of those pieces should connect to that conversation. They should all fall under that umbrella. We're just gonna mix mix metaphors. So, um, but uh, yeah, so when you're, when you're inventing your supporting characters, if you can think about their relationship with the theme, that's a useful, um, a useful way to invent a supporting character that feels integrated into the fabric of the story and has a function in your story as well because your supporting characters should be pushing your character either toward or away from the lesson that they're trying to learn from this series of events, right? That is the lesson of the theme. And so if your supporting character has a function that relates to that theme, so either they set a good example that leads your character toward this you know, revelation that they're gonna have eventually, or if they are a cautionary tale, if you don't learn the lesson of the theme, this is what you'll turn into. Those are just two examples, but you can connect your supporting characters to the theme in ways like that, and then that will both um, make them feel integrated into the, that one conversation that your story is having, and then also um, contribute to the growth of your character, um, either by pushing them toward the lesson that they need or providing more conflict and causing them to, to um, struggle toward that lesson as well. Well, maybe we could move on to another film and not my idea, which is maybe <laughs> Bridesmaids. Oh, sure. So if we look at the supporting characters in that, yeah. how, how did that move the main character more toward her goal? Well, so interestingly, um, those brides, the collection of Bridesmaids in Bridesmaids has sort of like two aspects to them that I think is really interesting. On the one hand, they each um, 
provide a different outlook on marriage or a different sort of like phase of marriage relationships, right? So you have kind of the, the newly married, um, doe-eyed, you know, idealist. You have the, uh, the like resolutely single playing the field, Melissa McCarthy, right? You have the woman who's been married so long, she has like three sons and she, she is tired of her husband, right? Um, you have Helen, who's kind of the bored trophy wife, um, and I think that's it, right? It's those four and then Kristen Wiig. And so they each represent kind of a different version of marriage. Um, and you know, the whole, we're, we're setting this story in the world of weddings and marriage and getting married and all that stuff. So that's very fitting. Um, but if you look at it as well, they each provide a different sort of attitude about um, growth and change, right? So, and that's really the journey that Kristen Wiig is on in this in this movie. She's trying to get unstuck from her life. Um, each of those characters have, if you could look at it, that they each have sort of a different perspective or uh, relationship to to being stuck or being, have, you know, making progress in your life. So the newly married one, she's excited for everything that's to come. Like all she has is sort of like rainbows and roses in her future, and she can't wait to be married forever. I think she says that at one point in the in the movie. Um, the, the woman who's been married too long, she ha she feels stuck and um, in a rut in her, in her marriage. Like, this is how things are. This is how they will always be. It's awful. <laughs> she needs to escape to Vegas, right? Um, the, the woman, Helen, who uh, is kind of the trophy wife and the big antagonist, she, um, she is not happy with the way things are in her life, but she is going about changing them in uh, in a, in maybe an unhealthy way we could look at it, right? So she and Kristen Wiig are sort of both equally as stuck in their lives, but they're stuck in very different lives. Um, and who am I missing? Oh, Melissa McCarthy. She is, she welcomes all change. She says <laughs> yes to everything, you know? So they all have a relationship to sort of change and being stuck or making progress or, you know, that, that kind of like realm, which is really what the thematic stuff of that movie is. Excellent. I love it. Yeah. I want to go watch it. <laughs> oh, good. <laughs> I'm hoping we can talk about a character with a goal and a character with no goal. Mm. And how would I be able to see that my screenplay has like a character with a weak goal? Oh, interesting. Well, so um, I think most movies that you watch, most mainstream movies that you watch are really built around a character pursuing something, right? So I would say they all, they all have pretty definable goals. Um, any movie that you'll see that's like in the theater, I take that back, not any movie that you'll see. Most movies that you'll see, they're, they're designed around somebody who wants something very badly and goes after it, right? Um, so uh, I would say if you're trying to figure out whether your character has a weak goal, um, probably the places that I would start would be at your break into two. This is assuming you've already written the script, right? At your break into two, do we know what your character is going to be pursuing over the rest of the movie? That is, that's their goal. That's, um, you might not always think of it as a goal. It might be, um, you might think of it as um, just a, a conflict, like this character and this character are competing for the same prize or something like that. You could look at it that way. But we know what we're tracking over that entire movie, right? Um, so I would say establishing that goal is one part of the question that you're asking. And then the other, the other part is whether they're pursuing that goal, right? And we want them to be pursuing it consistently and um, against great odds and opposition, right, throughout the entire movie. And so that is uh, something that you'd have to evaluate. Is my character in virtually every scene, it, are they pursuing that goal, that big picture thing that they're trying to accomplish? And if they are, are they also running into um, you know, some form of antagonism that's keeping them from making progress too quickly or achieving that goal right away without anything standing in their way? Because we want both of those things. We want a strong goal, but we also want your character to pursue it actively, and have to really try to get it. Right. So with with Bridesmaids, if we go back to that movie as an example, if we look at her, her goals, um, is the goal to win the friendship of the one friend or to show up the other woman? Well, so <laughs> I would say I would say that the um, the goal in that movie is for her to be her best friend's maid of honor, right? And um, 
the method, remember we talked about the method that she's going to use, is by competing with Helen, right? So, um, so she won't always have to compete with Helen in order to achieve that goal, but that's, that's her main force of antagonism, so she really is gonna have to compete with Helen most of the time. Um, and then I would say what's at stake in that movie is her friendship, among other things. But if we're, you know, we're just sort of laying out the, the, the sort of building blocks of the setup, that's um, how I would kind of delineate them. Does that make sense? It does. And so if I'm writing a script and someone's not clear on like why my character is doing certain things, does that sh maybe indicate that the goal, the hero's goal is not very clear? Well, if we know what they're trying to do, then I would say the goal is clear. But if we're not sure why they're doing something, I would say either um, there's just a sort of a, you know, a plot logic problem, like we don't understand why they think this thing is what they need to do. Um, or it could also be a stakes problem. So we don't understand why, <laughs> we don't understand why they're taking on this goal in the first place because we don't understand what it means to them or what will happen if they don't take it on or what happens if they fail, you know, all of those things. We need to really understand sort of the motivation behind your character's actions. And a lot of times that has to do with stakes. How does a writer effectively write overlapping dialogue between characters? Mm, there's a function in Final Draft that you just... <laughs> okay. <No. laughs> you just move on. Yeah. Well, actually, there are, there are a couple of different... I mean, really, it all goes back to clarity. So you're, you're just trying to convey, right, what we're going to be seeing and hearing on screen as clearly as you can on the page. And so there's a couple different things you can do. There really is the dual dialogue function, right, where you can have two characters speaking at the same time. They each have individual lines, and they're just set side by side. Um, or if you want a little bit, like, sort of of a messier ongoing conversation, I would say you'd probably just, you know, um, s sort of structure your dialogue so that you don't have complete sentences. You have sentences that are ending in a dash so that we know that one character is cutting off the other character. Make sure they're using like pretty short um, sides of dialogue so that it, it reads with that rhythm where it feels like, you know, one person's overlapping over another one if that's the effect that you're going for. Right, like sense. I'm thinking of uncut gems. I haven't it, seen oh, you haven't? Okay. No. Um, how about Moonstruck? <laughs> <laughs> sure. Yeah, yeah that there was a lot of yelling and, you know, and getting mad, or even yeah. um, my big fat Greek wedding, same mm -hmm. type of thing, you know, a lot, a lot of, but that's like, that's just how everybody was in that setting interacting. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think the the goal of the screenwriter is probably always to convey as much of the feel of that on the page as you can, and then of course, you know, when when it's um, in production, you'll you'll have some direction to help you out too. <laughs> right, right. And it was all in a loving way. Just, yeah, it just that's how they communicated. <laughs> right, right, right. What is subplot? Hmm. What is subplot? Um, <laughs> <laughs> I would say. I would say a true subplot is any um, is any plot separate from or plot line separate from the A story that has its own sort of goal and uh, through line, right? So a through line is going to be created by the pursuit of a goal. So it could be your protagonist with another goal that they're trying to pursue. I guess maybe the most common example that we could pull up would be, you know, your character is trying to rob a series of banks and then there's a romantic subplot. So he's also trying to have a romantic relationship with someone that has nothing to do with the banks, right? It's its own goal that has its own arc through the movie. Um, so I would call that a true subplot. You could also have a, su a subplot that's driven by another character. So your protagonist is robbing a series of banks unbeknownst to him or, or known to him, uh, his brother is trying to win custody of his child, right? So separate goal, separate, it's gonna have its own arc in the story, probably won't have equal weight, that's why we call it a subplot, right? Because you want your focus to be on the A story, but it'll have its own, um, there's a separate goal that's being pursued that has its own through line. Why do we need subplot? Um, I think you could argue that not all stories, not all movies need subplots, right? Like sometimes we watch movies and it sort of feels like everything is just connected to that A story and we don't really have separate true subplots. Um, but I think depending on the effect that you're trying to achieve and the sort of takeaway message that you're trying to give with your story, sometimes a subplot can complement that. So I'm trying to think of a good example. I feel like... Um, 
in Jerry Maguire, yeah. right? Yeah. Like the Rod Tidwell getting his getting his new offer from the team or whatever. Yeah. It's been a while since I've seen the movie, uh -huh. but I feel like that was a true subplot because it was, um, if I remember right, it was Jerry trying to get an offer for his for his client, right? So it would have been Jerry Jerry's sort of separate goal. Is that right? Gosh, now I don't remember. And I think he really needed Rod, didn't he? Because he was like his biggest client. Yeah. So it's kind of a stakes thing yeah. too. Yeah, now, now I'm confusing myself. I'm not sure if that's right, but I think that's true. So I think the subplot was he's trying to get a deal or an offer for Rod Tidwell from um, from Arizona, right? His, oh, his, current, yeah. uh, his current team. That subplot was necessary to Jerry Maguire's story because it, um, it complemented his learning that lesson of the theme, which is that you have to play with, with heart, right? You have to like um, stop being calculated and strategic sometimes and just put your whole heart into it, right? Um, so I think that you can look at subplots as helping to, again, teach your protagonist the lesson that they need to learn from this series of events. So Jerry gets fired and he um, he starts his own company and um, his romance with Dorothy, I think, is a subplot, right? Because that's a separate goal. He's having a, they, they very much overlap and a lot of times they happen in the same scenes, right? Where there are these two plot lines being pushed forward at the same time. Um, but starting his business and, and making it a success, gosh, now that I'm thinking about it, the Rod Tidwell thing might be part of that. And then the subplot of the romance would be, would be a separate um, storyline. That would be the romantic subplot that he's pursuing. Was that sure. your question? Yeah, yeah, I guess so. I mean, can so can a film have many subplots or yes. do they, oh, they can, okay. Yeah, okay. yeah, oh, I definitely think so. Um, and I think that um, how much weight a subplot has can vary greatly. Like you can have, you know, a romance subplot that actually is nearly equal with the A story. Um, or you can have something that ends up looking like sort of a runner through your script where it's like maybe it is a minor goal that the character is pursuing, but we only need to see three or four scenes where it's like introduced, pursued, and then accomplished or whatever. So um, I think you can have lots of subplots. Um, my caution <laughs> about having subplots would be just be careful that our focus stays on the A story because you have too many subplots, it can, if you have too many subplots and you're not um, keeping our focus on that main storyline, like that main conflict that we're watching, right? Um, it can end up feeling like we don't know which story we're supposed to be paying attention to. Uh, it can feel sort of scattered. So that's the only thing I would say be careful of. But most people are, when they come at writing a screenplay, they have a pretty good sense of like, what's that main story that they're trying to tell. Well, because is is it Dorothy is the is the Renee? Yeah. Is your okay. Because she has her own subplot in that, and I don't even know if you'd call it that, but that she's living with her sister, mm -hmm. and her sister, I guess, is like a divorcee and mm -hmm. older, and maybe a little more bitter. And the great scene of like Renee and Tom coming into the women's group, mm -hmm. and kind of like they all just shoot these daggers at Tom, you know, and he's trying to prove that he's a good guy. Yeah. And, and 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 against all odds, like he is a good guy and that she has this sister character who's real doubtful and just trying to fight against that. Yeah. So you see Renee and her situation, and I don't know if that's also a subplot. Well, but. so I would I would say that you could look at the subplot. So Renee Zellweger, I think, Dorothy, has her has um the romance subplot, we look at it from her point of view as well, right? So we actually see that relationship from both points of view. Oh, okay. I would say that her relationship with her sister is just a relationship and it's not its own subplot because they're not, Renee isn't necessarily pursuing anything. I don't think her sister is either. There, there isn't really a goal that, that we're sort of seeing the goal established and then seeing them pursue it and conflict and then resolution, right? So. I would say it's just a, I would call that a relationship with a supporting character. Um, and I would say that that supporting character uh, is is one of the benefits of the sister is that she helps, ref she helps Dorothy reflect on like what she really wants in life. The, you know, the, um, the sort of role of love in her life and how much she needs, how much she's willing to settle for, right? Which is kind of in that same thematic umbrella. When you're reading screenplays from unknown writers, how far into the screenplay do you know whether it's good or bad? 
Yeah, well, I think problems can show up very early in a script, right? Um, but they don't always. So, so some scripts have a great setup. They have a great first act, and they, you know, sort of have the right pace right away. They get the story rolling, and we feel like things are happening. We're invested, and then in Act Two, things fall apart basically like if their protagonist stops pursuing the goal we don't really know what's going on so um i mean i guess the answer is if if a script has global problems that sort of cover the entire script then you'll probably know within the first five pages or so um definitely i think if it has if it has like major structural problems with all the structure overall structure as a whole i would say by by you know page 15 or so you know that there's a problem because you're waiting for something to happen and one of the most common problems is that nothing's happening right like it's just not getting going so um so i would say that you can know right away or you can know pretty quickly that a script has some issues or needs some work um but i would also say you can't always tell what a script or often you can't tell what a script's issues are until later until you've seen sort of what they're trying to accomplish or gotten a true sense of like what the story really is or what they're going for and a lot of times you don't have that sense of what they're going for until later in the script until towards the end of act 2 at least you know so that that probably sheds light on the need for really having your script in good shape before you submit it and it's not it's not your personal thing it's more of an industry standard that if something within the first few pages isn't good it's just going to be rejected for time's sake yeah i will say so usually when i'm reading a script i'm reading it to help right i'm reading it to try to figure out what isn't working and see where i can um provide that insight to the writer so that they can make it better a lot of people in the industry as you know are not reading for that purpose they're they're looking for projects that they want to get involved in and so since you are submitting your script sort of asking someone to get involved in your project um hopefully what you've submitted will get them excited and interested right away so you want to be able to get them interested on page 1 get them sort of hooked in the story by that inciting incident um you know build and escalate your story uh sort of throughout the rest as they're as the characters pursuing that goal so that their your reader is invested and emotionally engaged and all that stuff through the whole thing and then you want to deliver like some emotionally satisfying resolution and hopefully some genuine emotion by the end of the story as well so that they come the reader comes away from your script moved and or entertained in some way you know so that they want to get involved and help you make it If we look back at let's say the recording industry they would say what well, put the best three songs mm. up front first because some A&R person or what I don't know I'm don't really know too much <laughs> about the music industry but I just remember hearing that that they're going to be listening to those three and if by maybe one or two in it's not good it goes it goes yeah. in a, in a bad pile so Yeah, yeah. although mm -hmm. I you know I mean the other the sort of flip side of doing that I guess there's a lot of emphasis placed on making sure that your first 10 pages is so good and really hooky and grabs your reader which is great of course you want it to do that but i have read scripts where it was very clear that the first 10 pages were were really worked on and then after that there there were clear issues that still hadn't been addressed and um you know so you don't want that either you want you want a great strong start that hooks your reader but then you want to deliver on what you've promised them you want them to become emotionally invested and to stay engaged all the way through and to really care about the outcome and and to feel something at the end you know interesting okay so so then you can't really cheat it where you're like i'm going to make these 10 pages the top 3 songs of the album and then it yeah. turns out that the rest of it is just all b-side stuff that no one wants to listen to <laughs> yeah. and and that's going to that's going to bite you in the end. Too. Yeah, I don't okay. think you can do that because the purpose of making your first 10 pages really really strong is to get someone to read the rest of it, right? So right. the rest of it has to be worth reading too. Is editing rewriting? Is editing rewriting? Well, I guess it depends on what you mean by editing um i would think of editing as just sort of like making little tweaks and and sort of language polishes or like you know shining up the words on the page right um i wouldn't mm, i wouldn't really consider that true rewriting i i think um 
that is actually something that people do is they say they're rewriting their script, but really they're just like moving words around and making it sound better, which is which is a valid pass that you want to take on your script. That that sort of polish where you're making sure that it reads really well all the way through. But uh, rewriting is a skill that really separates sort of newer writers from professionals or more experienced writers because being able to sort of understand what's not working about your script and then figuring out how to rewrite, how to, how to adjust um, in order to address that issue is that is a it's a it's a skill that it takes people I think a long time to sort of really figure out. A lot of times, people want to rewrite by by making like surgical changes, going in and changing one line of dialogue, or you know, um, oh that logic wasn't clear. Okay, I'll just add this line of dialogue here, and that'll address it. And sometimes that works, but not always. And so if you have a sort of a more global problem or something that can't be fixed in a line of dialogue, knowing how to kind of like pull the engine apart, fix the pieces, or change out the pieces, and then put it back together again, that's a whole other skill set that's very important to know. So, so there's there's polishing, which might be adding more finesse to a word, or just just do mm -hmm. something more descriptive. But then rewriting is really if you're changing something in Act One, it's probably going to have to go in and be tweaked it toward the end yeah. as well. Okay. Yeah, and I think that's the part that <laughs> that people don't like to hear is, you know, um, a lot of times the notes that you'll get from you know whoever's reading your script, uh, they'll you know there'll be things that can't be changed in a line of dialogue. They might, they might mostly be addressed in the setup or in act one, but then they'll have a domino effect where, okay, well now that that's working or that that feels right or is solid, then you have to think about like, where, where does this domino effect go in the rest of your script, right? Like where else does where else needs you know needs to be tightened up or or fixed addressed whatever in order to kind of like carry that all the way through carry the effect all the way through so that that note is fully addressed and not just kind of like band-aided you know is there screenwriting software that lets you know like you know danger danger you <laughs> change this this is a major like there should be. Thing. Oh, okay. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I don't, okay, so. I don't think there uh -huh. is, but also it's because I don't, I don't think that, um, I, I, I mean, that would be amazing if there was software that could do that, but I don't think there is because I think it's, uh, it's not something that is necessarily that, that black and white in terms of like the effect that it's going to have. If I change it in this scene, then I, you know, if I change it in scene three, then I have to go to ch scene 30 and change that. I don't think that those relationships are always um, going to be true because we, like we talked about, every story is different and every screenplay is different, right? So I think the skill, the reason that rewriting is so hard is because the skill it requires is being able to understand, being able to understand how your story works and how each of the pieces is working together and having an effect on the story so that when you change one, you understand, okay, now that I have changed this piece and it's having this effect, that means that the engine is gonna be lopsided over here or whatever and I need to adjust these other things. I feel like that's not a very clear example, no, but. No, I, so, so basically yeah. it's, it's a human skill. It can't be, at this point, can't yeah. be, done via AI or some other I scraping so. tool that's gonna know. <laughs> yes, I mean, I, like I said, I think that would be great if, <laughs> if there was something like that. Maybe there could be something that, that um, uh, sort of flagged scenes that you might wanna look at, right? But I do think it's a more, it's, it's, really, um, it's really like seeing in story, right? Like being able to look at the screenplay and understanding the story as an engine that all the pieces work together. And so if you change one, which other pieces need to be adjusted, you know? What are stakes and sacrifice and how do they work together? Oh, that's a good question. Um, so, so commonly we think about stakes in your story as the consequence or the thing that will happen if your character fails to achieve their goal, right? So um, like we were talking about in Bridesmaids, if uh, Kristen Wiig fails at being her best friend's maid of honor, then her friendship is, her friendship will probably fail or, you know, her friendship's at stake. So their, her friendship will take a hit, right? Um, she may lose her best friend. So that's what's at stake is her friendship with uh, Lillian. Um, 
sacrifice is it's this is you know this is sort of a story nerd distinction to look at because you can kind of lump all of these things together but sacrifice is what your character um it's sort of the cost of participation of your character taking on this goal or this task that they're trying to do right so the, the cost of participation tells us um, how important a goal is to someone if they're really willing to sacrifice a lot in order to pursue this thing, right? So Bridesmaids is a great example, but just say that um, in order to go for the Olympic gold, I have to uh, give up my family, my girlfriend, my job, all this stuff. Those are all cost of participation things. Those are all sacrifices that I'm making in order to pursue this goal. What's at stake if I don't win the gold is perhaps my Olympic gymnastics career, right? So those are two different things. So my career's at stake, that is hanging in the balance, but the sacrifices that I'm making are separate from that. However, the sacrifices can help me see how important this goal is to this character because I'm willing to sacrifice all that stuff in pursuit of it. The challenge with sacrifice is making sure that the sacrifice isn't so big and unwarranted that the audience then thinks your character's stupid, <laughs> right? Because if they're giving up all this stuff and it feels like, oh, but they're giving up all this stuff for what? For this goal that, you know, to to enter the, the town race to win a, a new griddle or something, like that doesn't seem like it's worth giving up all this stuff. So your audience won't get on board with your character pursuing a goal that doesn't seem to warrant all the sacrifice that they're making. An example that I always use is The Ring. So The Ring is about a woman who um, who watches a cursed videotape and then she has seven days to solve the mystery of this curse in order to stop it and save her life, right? So what's at stake in that pursuit is her life. We know that her life is hanging in the balance. If she fails at achieving that goal, she's going to die. Um, the sacrifices that she makes in pursuit of that goal include um, spending less time with her son. So we know that this saving her life is very important to her, not only to save her life, right, life and death, but also because she doesn't, she's a single mom and she doesn't wanna leave her son an orphan, right? But so she's sacrificing time with him, time that could make her feel like a, a good mom, a, um, attentive mom, but she has to make that sacrifice in order to pursue the goal because the goal is so important to her because the stakes are so big. Does that kind of make sense? It does. Okay. okay. What do you think 99% of screenwriters get wrong with their screenplays? One of the biggest things that I see as issues in scripts that I read, right? So I don't know if it's 99% of screenwriters get this wrong, but I will say it is very common, is um, not building the stakes properly so that the audience is invested. So, so you know, it could be an exciting story, but we'll only go along so long with, you know, somebody trying to do something if we don't understand why they're doing it or what it means to them, right? So um, building the stakes of showing us, you know, what not only what happens if they fail to achieve this goal, but also why does that matter? Why is it so important to them? Um, what does that mean to them internally? Sort of all of those questions are really what get us emotionally invested, right? So if we look at the movie Bridesmaids again, um, the you know her goal is to be her best friend's maid of honor. What's at stake is externally is her friendship. We know that her the friendship is kind of the last good thing she has in her life. And um, if she fails at being her best friend's, if she fails at pulling off this sort of like maid of honor duty for her best friend on her most important day, right, that their friendship is gonna suffer. So that's what's at stake for her. However, there's also a deeper internal thing that that means for the protagonist. She her friendship being the last best, or sorry, the last good thing that she has in her life speaks to her self-worth. She has essentially failed in all other aspects of her life. If she fails at this, she will have proven she's not a good enough friend. She can't keep up with where her friend is sort of going in her life, right? Like her friend is kind of moving into this rich people's world and adult world. She's getting married. She's going to have a real like you know, house and husband and, and all this stuff. So it's, it, all of that kind of speaks to how Annie, the Kristen Wiig character, feels about herself. If she fails at doing this, it will say something about her as a person. So that, you know, setting up those like 
or helping the, under, the audience understand the deeper meaning behind the stakes. It's great to have external concrete stakes that we can see because we're watching movies, right? But helping the audience understand what it really means and why that meaning is so important to the character, I would say that's one of the biggest things that people miss when they're writing scripts. So do you think maybe a lot of people might have a clear goal for their character and, and that we see that this character wants it at all costs, but we're not seeing the little sub things in their lives that will suffer yeah. if they don't get it and all the things they have to sacrifice or do or compromise. Yeah, I think it's, it's um, a lot of people understand that they need stakes in their story. They're, they're, you know, there needs to be some consequence for failure, right? Otherwise, why is this character doing this thing? Um, but I think the thing that a lot of people miss is, is tying those stakes to a deeper meaning. So it's not just an external thing. It's not just, because when you're dealing with things that aren't life and death, it's, it's even more important to go into the, the, the why behind it, right? That letting us know, why does this, why does it matter? Who cares if this character fails uh, at being a maid of honor? Who cares, right? That those external stakes, we get them and we see them, but they only get us emotionally invested because we understand what they mean to the protagonist. So that's the part, you know, and, and that's the hard thing to do, which is probably why it's missed a lot. So, Right, I'm thinking of, let's say, Lady Bird. Mm -hmm. We talked about that. So if the main character, she grew up, I think, in Sacramento, mm -hmm. and but she felt like she grew up on the wrong side of the tracks where all her friends maybe were a little more affluent and she's always wanted to kind of prove that yeah. she belonged in that world kind of thing. Yeah. And so even though she has this like loving family at home, yeah. it, it, to her, she just wants to be accepted in, in the friendship world. So I think if I remember right, her, her goal in that movie, like the, the actual sort of external goal that we're kind of like hanging the, you know, the plot on, like the structure of the movie, I think it was getting accepted into an East Coast school. Was that right? Right. And then the mom's like, well, you're just going to go to community yeah. college. And, yeah. <laughs> right. And so, so if we just say that's her goal, and I can't remember for sure if this is exactly the way the movie was structured, but if we say that's her goal, is like she's, she's pursuing getting accepted to an East Coast school. If she fails at getting accepted to an East Coast school, She's going to have to go to Sacramento State and prove her mom right, right? So that's kind of the external stakes. But what does that mean to her internally? I would say it would, to her, going off of what you said, it would prove that she isn't as good as those kids that she wants to fit in with, or maybe that she'll never be anything more than you know, the surroundings that she grew, grew up in, right? Which for most of the movie she sees as not good enough. Right. I think by the end she comes around to sort of appreciating the upbringing she had and, and where she came from, right? But, um, but for most of the movie she feels like this is, very, this is a very important goal to her because she's trying to leave this behind. And if she can't do that, it will basically prove that she fits in here at this place that she doesn't think is good enough, you know? Right, right, okay. Yeah, and I think actually that's what a lot of people related to because it's that internal feeling of like, I think a lot of people can relate to that, like wanting to, wanting to sort of get out of the town that you were raised in, right? And then maybe maybe relating even to the eventual feeling of like, oh, it wasn't so bad. I actually kind of appreciate that. Right, or, or growing up in a town where there's like a, a divide mm -hmm. in, in access to different things and, and wanting to go with the kids that, the cool kids that seemed like they had everything and right. they had the big house and, and her feeling like she was less than because her parents, even though hardworking, or I know the dad was out of work for yeah. a while, but you know, especially the mom, you know, was, was a nurse or whatever and feeling like, well, it wasn't glamorous enough. Yeah. And she wanted to be a new... Yeah, she wanted to be this other person, mm -hmm. right? And um, I think failing at that goal, kind of, kind of what was internally at stake for her was proving that she couldn't be that other person. She couldn't be more than, I guess, she was born into, you know? Right, okay. Yeah. How does a writer create an emotional core for their story where the audience will relate and go on the journey and feel the ups and downs? Um, well, I usually talk about the emotional core as being sort of a, a combination of four components, actually five. So there's a, another fifth stealth element here. Um, so the four that I think um, are involved are the things that basically the character has to prioritize over the course of the story. And the way they 
prioritize those things, sort of the change in their priorities shows us the effect that the plot events have had on them, if that makes sense. So they start out um, in a status quo. So they have a, we're, we're just going to get real technical with it. <laughs> so they yeah, start yeah. out with an inner drive. So some, some sort of inner motivation that's um, causing them to, uh, that's sort of, I take that back, that's, that's motivating their actions in life, right? I'll use my favorite example. So in Die Hard, um, John McClane shows up on page one wanting to fix his marriage. That's what's driving him internally. So we know that he has come to LA. He wants to bring his wife back to New York. Their marriage has been uh, sort of struggling, whatever. So we know that that's what's driving him internally. Um, he also has a misbehavior. So some people call this a character flaw. Um, I like to call it a misbehavior because uh, I don't think it has to be objectively negative, right? So it's a it's a behavior that isn't serving them as well as they think it is, or it's some strategy that they're using in order to pursue that inner motivation, right? So he shows up on page one wanting to um, fix his marriage. And the strategy that he's using for that is by being macho and uncompromising, right? So he's basically a caveman when he shows up. He's like, <laughs> I'm gonna take my wife and drag her back to New York with me, right? That's kind of his attitude when he shows up. So those are the first two elements. That's kind of the character status quo, right? What's motivating them internally and the, the way they're going about getting it, which is really their defining characteristic. It's their misbehavior, right? Uh, and then the other two things are the stakes and, and the goal. And we've already talked about those, so you know what those are very well. So those four things are in play. Um, they're, they're put in play basically in the setup of your story, right? So he shows up on page one wanting to fix his marriage. The way he's going about it is by being macho and un uncompromising. Uh, over the course of act one, terrorists show up and he forms the story goal of needing to save those hostages from the terrorists, right? and one of the hostages is his wife. So that's his story goal. What's at stake? The lives of the hostages, including his wife, right? He really wants to save his wife's life, obviously, because that goes to uh, fixing his marriage. So those four things, these are his priorities when we have completed our setup. As we watch the movie uh, and he, his pursuit of that goal and all of the things that are happening to him as he pursues the goal, all of the complications and obstacles and that main force of antagonism, those things and his, um, the, the plot events that he's um, encountering are forcing him to reprioritize. Now, Die Hard is, is a slightly rare example because um, he, he isn't necessarily forced to re reprioritize by his interaction with the terrorists, but because he goes through this whole experience of potentially losing his wife, right? He, she might die, he might die, they may never be able to get back together and make it work, right? Because that's hanging in the balance, he is forced to have sort of this like come to Jesus moment where he's like, I have been doing things wrong. He says to his cop buddy on the outside, like if I ever get out of here, or if I don't get out of here, tell my wife that I was wrong or that I should have done things differently or something like that. I can't remember the exact dialogue, but it, he has that moment where he admits that he has been going about things the wrong way because he thought he knew the right way. He didn't give her enough credit, right? So he continues through the rest of the plot. And then by the end of the movie, we see how he has prioritized those four things. So he has managed to save the hostages. So he's accomplished the goal. He has protected his stakes because he has saved the lives of those hostages, including his wife. Um, he is going to be able to fix his marriage. We get the sense, right? Because his wife and he have that like moment at the end um, where they're working together, right? And then his, uh, his misbehavior is the last thing that's, that's left that could potentially change. And so by the end of the movie, this may be my interpretation, but I think that he has come to realize that he cannot treat his wife like he's a caveman and he's macho and uncompromising anymore. He has to take her needs into account too, her input. She's a smart lady. She's clearly like had this whole career that she didn't need him for, right? So they're more equals than he thought. He doesn't have to protect her all the time. He can let her be a part of their marriage. They can be a partnership. So he has re he has reprioritized those four things. And really what I mean by that is he's He's sort of like, you know, let go a little bit of the macho-ness in order to get the other things, saving his marriage, you know, um, uh, saving hostages, um, 
basically that's it, saving the hostages and protecting their lives, right? So the way he re reprioritizes those things shows us the uh, emotional arc and the character arc, right? Now we know how he's changed. We know that he started out thinking he had to be this macho protector, and by the end, he knows that he can actually allow his wife to be a real partner in their marriage, and they can work together and ride off into the sunset together. <laughs> does that make sense? Yes, it does. Okay. Wow. Yeah. That's excellent. <laughs> I don't even remember what my initial question was because I'm like still I'm thinking about the movie and right, right, and how he yeah. softens a little bit, has a little more humor to him. Right, right. And at the end. Die Hard yeah. is a big action movie, so it's not like he's gonna have this, you know, profound like internal change where he goes from being macho to being just a pussycat who's, you know, not gonna stand up to anyone. It's not gonna right. be that kind of like 180 change. But we do see that he has reprioritized those four things. And that's what the question was, which was about the emotional core. So that's what the emotional core I, it's just a term that I use to sort of encapsulate the character arc and the emotional journey and kind of the um, the takeaway message of the theme all in one because that's really, when we see that character go through this experience and have this particular change or adjustment in attitude, that tells us, that gives us the lesson of the theme. It tells us what's important uh, that we need to know about how to live a better life or be a better person or whatever. And if we look at the stakes too, it's not just the terrorists, but then... The, aren't they like in a very high point on the building? Yeah. Just be like the Arco building or whatever, the, the yeah. highest one in LA. Yeah. And so there's the stakes of that. How are they going to access this level? And there's different, you know, they're going in the stairwells and things like yeah. that. So that adds. It's the Nakatomi to building. Oh, okay. Sorry. <laughs> no, okay. in the movie. In the movie, it's the Nakatomi oh, oh, okay. building. Oh, okay. Right. Okay. Um, in, it's in Century City. Um, ah. But yeah, so the stakes, well, so the stakes are really the the life of the hostages, right? Including John McClane's wife. So that's that's what he's trying to save. And then he's he we talked about um, stakes and sacrifice. He is sacrificing his own safety in order to protect those stakes, right? Which is, you know, again, story nerd stuff, but valuable to think about because it's like if he was going to risk his life to get his wife out of a parking ticket, we'd be like, that's I'm not, I'm not on board with the story. People would check out, they'd stop reading, stop watching the movie or whatever, right? So the, the stakes and the sacrifice have to really balance. We have to understand how, how they warrant each other, essentially, you know? Well, you say story nerd like it's, like it's a bad thing or you have to <laughs> apologize. Wouldn't, doesn't someone have to really be a story nerd to write well? Because if you're too cool for story, then you're gonna ignore a lot of the details and a lot of this parts of this engine, correct? Or yeah, well, I mean, thank you for saying that. <laughs> no, I, I think, so, um, so I like thinking about kind of the, the theory of how, you know, how stories work and all the parts, and I, that's my favorite thing. That's why I do what I do. But I actually think that, um, I mean, yes, is it valuable for writers to understand? Definitely. Um, I don't think everyone is as nerdy about it as I am, but so and and I don't think that's a problem. Uh, I do think a lot of writers come at their stories sort of instinctively and intuitively, and you know we all have kind of that sense of a story, right? Like we all understand beginning, middle, and end, and um, we ha we've had that ingrained in us since we we're kids, and so I think. I think a lot of writers don't need to understand kind of the minutia of all of this stuff as much as, as much as um, I enjoy talking about it, um, because they come at their stories instinctively and they just have a story they want to tell and it can you know they can get it on the page without thinking about stakes or you know sacrifice maybe um, on the first pass right. But where I where I do think it will come in handy is if. Um, if you are struggling to make a story work or s several screenplays work, right? If you're kind of running into the same problems over and over, then I think it's super valuable to look at what is it that I am instinctively not getting, right? Where is that thing happening that's that's not allowing my story to work as well as it could? Uh, and then that's maybe the, the, the part of the story nerd canon to, <laughs> to dive into. Um, just figuring out like, what is the thing that uh, I'm not automatically bringing to the page and, and you know, sort of like understanding that part of it a little bit better and maybe honing those skills. So then the story nerd can take the Rubik's <laughs> Cube apart and have all the pieces down and put it back together, but the, 
they don't someone can still configure the the cube just to have it all the same colors on each side and they're still going to be a good Rubik's cube solver. <laughs> right. Okay. So they don't have to necessarily pull every little yeah. plastic piece out. Yeah. I mean, I, I think that's a really good analogy that I had never thought of. Um, but yeah, I think that's true. Like I really like, and I do think of it in, in terms of like being a mechanic, I really like being able to totally disassemble a story and look at each little part and go, oh, I see what you did there. And I see what you did there. And I see how you're making all of these things work together. And that's really cool. And here's the one thing that's, that's knocking, right? Or that's like, I'm actually not a car person, but here's the one thing that is making that funny noise. So let's look at that and maybe talk about why, um, the choice that you made isn't as strong as it could be or is getting in the way of something else or whatever it is, right? So um, so I like to be a story nerd because I, I just enjoy it. Um, and I think that I can, sometimes I can help other people understand the one little area that they might not be fully understanding by bringing that to them, but I don't think every writer needs to be able to, you know, understand every single every single thing that we've talked about today. Would you advise your students to start a screenplay without an outline and just start writing, don't worry about structure? So um, I think that you should do whatever works for you. And um, you know, not everyone likes to write with an outline. Different processes work for different people. So I think whatever works for you is great. However, I do think that um, a lot of writers, you know, especially if they're just learning the craft, they get stuck without an outline. And so for that reason, I do teach an outlining class because I think that um, having a strong outline can really help you make it all the way through to your finished first draft, right? Which is which is where you're going to learn the most. It doesn't you don't learn as much by starting ten screenplays as you do by finishing one screenplay. So I do think having an outline can really help you make it through the process, which is why I advise doing it if you don't already have a process that works for you. Um, I also think that you know the writing process is a lot of work and you end up doing the same amount of work regardless. So to me, it's preferable to do the heavy lifting up front, figure out all of the stuff, make all the mistakes you're gonna make with plotting in the outlining phase so that um, you don't have to spend all that time writing the script and then work with a hundred pages, you're working with five pages of an outline when you're trying to rearrange things, figure out why your structure's not working, figure it, you know, figure out how to escalate things or, or whatever it is that you're doing. Do you ever see some of the students do an outline and realize, I don't like my story? Yes, I think that that can happen, um, but I think it's usually temporary. So, um, Part of the fun of outlining, I think, is is actually that you are doing a lot of the heavy lifting, right? So you're thinking through what are all the details? How is this, you know, how's the plot going to progress? What's the character arc? What are the relationships like? What are the, you know, big set pieces? What are the obstacles? All that good stuff. So you're actually doing a lot of the fun imagining and story creation stuff in the outlining phase. So I think for that reason, it doesn't happen very often where somebody outlines a whole story and then decides they don't like it enough to write it. Um, I think that when that does happen, a lot of times the problem isn't actually in having gotten through the outline itself. The problem is really in the concept. So now that they've seen what this concept looks like in, you know, fully fleshed out into a whole story, then they go, oh, that wasn't, you know, I thought there was something interesting there, but now it, it does, it's not delivering like the entertainment value that I wanted or whatever, whatever they don't like about it. So I think um, if you get to a full outline and at that point you're feeling disappointed in your story, it might have something to do with that initial, you know, premise that you came up with. Getting a script to someone for fresh eyes, how does a writer know that they're getting their script to the right person? What if they're getting it to a friend who's only going to tell them great things, what they want to hear. And then conversely, what if they get it to someone who the writer views as overly critical, but actually that's the best person to give it to? Yeah. I mean, you're asking the eternal question (laughs) of like, no, no, it's good. Um, Because that is really confusing, right? If you've, if you've gone through the whole struggle of finishing your screenplay, the next question is like, who, who do I give it to? (laughs) Who reads it? Um, 
So I don't necessarily think, it, think it's a bad thing if you want to give your script to somebody who's going to give you praise. I think that that's okay. That can make you feel good, right? And kind of get you over the hump of like, okay, now I need to rewrite it. Um, but I wouldn't rely solely on all positive reviews. Um, I think the things to think about maybe when you're having people read your script for the purpose of giving you feedback or notes that you're going to implement into your, you know, into your next draft. Um, think about where this person is coming from in terms of experience, how many scripts they read. Um, you know, because reading a script is a whole, it's a whole thing that you have to get used to, right? Like if my mom read a script tomorrow, she would not know what to make of it. She wouldn't have any idea sort of how to consume a story in this medium. So someone who has a lot of experience reading scripts, they're just going to have a better sense of what's working and not working just right off the bat, I think. Um, I would be careful that you're not giving it to someone who um, who doesn't have your best interests, right? Which can sometimes be the danger of writers groups. Um, not everyone, you wanna make sure the person who's reading your script is wants to help you get that script where you want it to be, not where they they want it to be unless you're unless you're writing for a producer. So so then, you know, then you're going to do what they what they want you to do. But um no, but if you're just writing a spec and you're trying to get feedback on it to improve the script, um you want to make sure that the people reading it have experience so that they can understand how to process a story in a script and then also that they um they want to help you achieve your goal with the script versus turning it into what they think it should be. I think those are probably the two main things I would say to look out for. And experience doesn't necessarily equate with having your best interests. Yeah, okay. that's definitely true. Yeah. And that really sounds like something that it's going to be case by case. You're just not going to know. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I guess that is... You know, hopefully if you're giving to if you're giving your script to somebody for a friendly read, so it's not a service that you're paying for or something like that, right? If it's just, you know, your friend that you met in writing class and you want to get notes from them, um, hopefully you know them well enough that you can gauge what kind of where they're coming from with their notes, right? Are they going to help you try to get where you want to be? Um, and if you don't know that about them and you give them your script anyway, hopefully you understand the difference between notes that are helping you and notes that are taking you totally away from your original vision, right? And that's a good thing to think about too, is um, distinguishing between those types of notes or being able to. You have to be able to take a note in, sort of evaluate its usefulness to you, and then not get your feelings hurt and decide decide if you're going to implement it or not. Right. And, and just this is me saying this, not not you, but um, also maybe be careful of people too eager to mm. take a look at your stuff. And hey, let me actually, why don't you email me that? Because sometimes then you can see that, wow, and then you get this feedback and it's totally, it, it's it's not only helpful, it's discouraging. So sometimes there's like this this sheep in, or what is it, a wolf in sheep's clothing, and yeah. you don't totally realize it. Yeah. So it's, I think it's just developing a rapport with someone because you'll you'll quickly see that. Yeah, and while. also another uh, sort of good you know yardstick to measure whether you want somebody to read um, is just talking about them about movies in general or other screenplays, right? Because you can gauge somebody's taste. You can gauge whether you agree with them on the things that, because everyone has opinions about movies they've seen, like, oh, the ending of that was terrible, or whatever. If you disagree with everything they're, they're saying, maybe that's not a person you want to have read your script because clearly you have a difference in you know, point of view when it comes to like what makes a good story or what makes a story work. So I'd say that's something that you can, you know, sort of keep in the back of your mind as, as a way to gauge whether someone should read your material or not. Yeah, so it sounds like um, story mechanics take a long time to fine tune and also finding that person for feedback takes the same. Yeah, um, and also another thing you could do is trade reads, right? Because if you, if you have someone who is invested in getting good feedback from you or useful feedback and um, not getting their feelings hurt, then you'll probably have a little bit more of an even trade there too, right? That's a good point. Yeah. What are your top three screenwriting rules? 
top three screenwriting rules? Well, um, I mean, very broadly, don't bore the reader. <laughs> don't confuse the reader. And um, make me feel something. Yeah. Those are good. Yeah. Okay. I mean, I know those are pretty, pretty broad ones, but really that's what you're looking for when you read a script. Don't bore me. What did I say? Don't confuse me mm -hmm. right. and, and make me feel something. Okay. Yeah. Okay. That's not confusion or boredom. Yeah. <laughs> yes, exactly. Yeah. Okay. Um, for the first script that you see from someone, how often are all those boxes checked? Not very often. Well, I'll take that back, especially a first draft, right? So in your first draft, there's almost always going to be something, and this isn't just for new writers, this is for everybody. In your first draft, there's almost always going to be something that could be, you know, ramped up so that I'm not bored or something that could be clarified so that I understand what's happening or what I'm watching or why I'm watching it. Um, and the, f the feeling thing, I think, is, the, is probably the hardest one to get. Um, so that's probably the one that's missing the most often. What's your favorite chapter of Save the Cat? <laughs> oh, that's a good question. Um, let's see. I'm going to go with chapter four. <laughs> Which is? <laughs> no, I'm kidding. Okay. Uh, no. <laughs> no, so chapter four is where he breaks down the 15 beats on the Save the Cat beat sheet. Um, the only reason I know that is because we use that that particular chapter in the workshop. So, um, but I do like that one. That was the one the first time I read it that really, you know, I mean, and I think a lot of people have this reaction. They read it and they go, oh, this feels so easy. This feels like I understand the way a story works. Even if I thought I understood it before, now I feel like... I could articulate it, you know? He's sort of like putting into words something that we all kind of sense, um, but maybe haven't been able to talk about, you know? And you teach some of the Save the Cat the writing through your own workshop or through the Save the Cat? Brand? Just through Save the Cat, yeah. So oh, I actually okay. teach the LA workshops for Save the Cat that are um, weekend workshops, so it's a two-day thing, yeah. Oh, great. Where could someone find out more about? Uh, on the Save the Cat website. Oh, great, yeah. okay. What type of screenplay should a new writer focus on writing or not focus on writing? That's a good question. So I think, um, again, you can, you can write whatever you want to write, but um, I think you're setting yourself up for success if you are sort of still in that beginning learning curve, if you start out with a more straightforward story. So one that has a very clear protagonist, a, you know, a nice clear external story goal for them to pursue with like a clear end point so that we know when they've won or lost, um, a good clear external force of antagonism, right? Because you're gonna make your job easier if you can have external things that you can Put on screen um, and good clear stakes too. So I think if you have all of those, all of those foundational pieces in a very um, sort of straightforward way in your story, that's going to be an easier story for you to sort of learn on. It's it's you know think of it as a as a learning exercise to figure out how to put a screenplay together. You're just going to make that learning curve. Um, a little bit easier to handle if you are working with those elements that are more straightforward. So as great as Crash and the hours are, don't don't start maybe with something like that where it's like different vignettes or yeah. different stories that... Yeah. I would say those would be tough to start on because if you don't totally... I guess it's if you don't totally have like that rhythm of story, right? Like the, the pace and knowing when things need to happen in order to keep our interest or get us emotionally invested or keep us engaged, you know, all that stuff. Um, if you haven't really like internalized that yet, then it's hard to sort of um, put a story together using different vignettes or storylines or whatever that's going to function the right way, that's going to hit all of those things that we need in order to get invested and stay invested in the story. Um, because, you know, that's like, those are sort of tricky, tricky stories to lay out. And um, if you're dealing with a more straightforward story, you're going to have an easier time sort of figuring out like, okay, so I just have to focus on this one protagonist. How can I get my audience to care about him? What is it about his story goal that's so meaningful to him? And how can I show that to the audience? It's sort of like, um, I don't know, I guess... Um, 
don't have a good example for you. <laughs> I was going to say it's it's um, it's just a, a very basic, you know, I guess learning the the sort of um, basic cooking skills before you start, you know, trying to make the Julia Child French, you know, whatever repertoire of food. So. Right, right. Don't yeah. make a bouillabaisse before you can do scrambled eggs. There you <laughs> go. There you go. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, what about genre? Should people stick with one genre in the beginning? Uh, when they're learning, um, I I think you should write whatever you want to write. Um, I mean, genre-wise, in terms of like when you are writing screenplays that. Um, because, you know, let's face it, like your first screenplay probably isn't going to be great and probably isn't going to be the one that you show to a bunch of people. So if you want to write one horror and then see how you do with a rom-com, great. I think you're, again, you're learning so much just by finishing those scripts. Um, you're learning how to put a story together, how to convey that story in a screenplay. If you're working in different genres, you're also sort of learning how to, you know, the, the intricacies of different genres and what we expect from them and how those work. So I think those are all great learning experiences. Uh, if you're at the point where you're trying to sort of make a career, then I think it's useful to think about your portfolio that you're representing to people, right, or presenting to people. Um, and in, in terms of your portfolio, you want that to speak uh, to who you are as a writer. And so then it's probably useful to think about, you know, working in one niche or one genre. Um, but again, you don't have, you don't have to pigeon your, pigeonhole yourself either. I have uh, several writers that I work with who, you know, started in one genre and then sort of transitioned into other genres when they, when they wanted to, or when they decided that that was going to be better for their careers. Um, other writers I know who are working writers, they, you know, they write a rom-com for Netflix and then they write a horror movie for an indie producer and it works out fine for them too, so. 